What'd you think of Impact? What a bullshit show this was. This was... There was a really, really good match towards the end that saved this from being a contender for one of the worst impact, worst impacts I ever saw. It was a bad show. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. Now, uh, I'm not going to rant and rave about the show today. I'm not going to do that anymore. Why not? I don't see a reason for it. I say the same it, thing every week. It accomplishes week. nothing? I say the same thing every week and nothing ever changes. Well, okay, this I consider this a positive step. Hopefully this will progress from us not ranting about it to not reviewing it and then finally not watching it. I, awesome. Maybe that'll happen someday, but this show was average. This was an average impact. I've seen better. I've seen worse. Maybe it's just because I, I, I made up my mind not to get mad about it, but... Um, yeah, it was what it was. A giant reeking pile of shit. <laughs> I've seen so many worse shows that I can't even call it that. It did start with the uh, Sting Delia Bob. They, they actually, this show is called Sting versus the Fans. And the first thing I thought was, the fans love Sting. Yeah. I did watch last week, so I couldn't help notice that everything he said, they cheered. Sting's promo at the end of, of the show here was just awesome. It's just, it was a show written by a man who was wrong. <laughs> Indeed, yes. And he was trying to prove that he could be right. So. And unlike me, he failed. <laughs> we'll get to that later. But yes, the, the show was titled Sting vs. the Fans, who love him. Yeah. And then we were told Sting will address the fans, yeah. which he did last week. Yeah, well, yeah. I guess he's doing it again. So we had Kurt and Booker T come out, and Booker, uh, I believe Booker should be the champion just based on being the best-dressed man in this business. I, I firmly believe that. And they were both in suits. Angle said this is what real-world champions look like, unlike that slob Joe. He called him a disgrace to the championship. Booker said yes, indeed. They, they said that at the pay-per-view, the two of them were going to battle at it to determine who the next champion would be. So uh, out came Christian who said he was going to qualify for the title match tonight. And I, as God is my witness, as God is my witness, as stupid as this scramble match bullshit is, at least I know all of the matches on the pay-per-view. And I am usually not very good at this stuff. We've got an ECW scramble. We've got a Raw scramble. We've got a SmackDown scramble. We've got Jericho versus um, Shawn Michaels. We've got the women's title match for SmackDown with Maurice versus Michelle McCool. And we've got Crime Time versus Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase. Voila. With that said, TNA's pay-per-view is next week. I have no goddamn fucking idea when this show started what the main event was. And when Christian came out and said he was going to qualify, I was like, qualify for what? What's the fucking match? It's just another four-way. See, I, I, I knew there was... I knew what the main event was. It was Joe defending his belt in a match with a bunch of guys. I forgot how many people were in it. And I can't really blame TNA for this entirely because, well, partly because their matches sometimes have five guys, sometimes have four. And now we have all the scramble matches going up with the five. And I thought there were five in this match, too. Wrong. And I kept thinking in my head, Joe, Booker, Kurt, Christian, there's one missing. Come on, guys. And then I realized, no, no, I was wrong. I just remember when wrestling main events were the champion against a challenger. No more. And it was very easy. Those are always the biggest drawing matches, too. But so? People still... It doesn't matter. The matters is doing new stuff. I guess so. Christian said this pay-per-view was in his backyard, and I was like, aren't they all? But I guess he was talking about Canada, even though he lives in Florida. So his backyard is actually the impact zone. They got in a big brawl. There was a line about Christian said that Booker was worried about losing a spot. And I'm like, what spot? What spot are you losing in what is supposed to be a shoot? I don't understand. So... <laughs> Anyway, they got in a brawl. AJ came down to clear the ring. Kurt challenged him to a tag match. Cornet came out and said no. And then, in something that annoyed me, as is always the case in TNA, Cornet said, the people want to see this match, AJ versus Christian. Therefore, if either of you two guys run in, you are out of this title match. And I just thought, you're in charge, asshole. God bless Jim Cornet, but... You're in charge. Why not just say that anybody who ever runs in is just banished? Do that for every match. 
I mean, don't the fans want to see all the matches? No, apparently only Christian and AJ. That's I guess the they only want to see they the wanna big see. matches. This is bullshit. Not even just all the big matches. Only Christian Cage versus AJ Styles. Apparently. No other combination of wrestlers on the roster gets the banishment for interference. So, yes, th- th- there's a ton of little things here that annoyed me. Th- that was the biggest one. Cornick, and after he's announced no interference in that match, they then played AJ Styles' music. Why? I don't know. I don't know. But Because uh, he got in a victory. Yes. <laughs> no run-ins victory. No run-ins victory. Kurt went out to... Kurt... Christian was on the ramp and... Kurt and Booker were in the ring, so Kurt went out to fight Christian, got his ass kicked. He's a heel, so that's good, and then they double-teamed Christian for a while, then AJ came out, and, and they fought off the heels, then Cornette came out, and it was just there was so much stuff going on here in this first segment. And then we got another interview. Another interview, you say? That's two. Joe was cutting a promo on Nash, who he hates again this week. And <laughs> he ranted about Sting saying that Sting was taking money out of Joe's and the fans' pockets by sitting in the rafters and not wrestling. Now, I don't want to break this down too much, but if this was real and you got paid per match, for example, and there was another guy that never had any matches, how is this taking money out of your pocket? Well, apparently... Wouldn't it make sense that if he were getting your matches, that would be taking money out of your pocket? Apparently, TNA had a job for a guy who sits in rafters, a and rafter you, sitter. And Joe wanted it? And Joe wanted it, or he wanted some young, hardworking chap to get it. He didn't want this th- 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 this established guy to come in, rest on his laurels, and take a job sitting in the rafters from someone else. I see. That's what I got out of this promo. Then we had another Consequences Creed segment. They talked to one of his school teachers. <laughs> well, I don't know. They just ran out of people to talk to. <laughs> exactly. Let's talk yeah. to his third grade teacher. So then we had another interview with Sheik Bashir. This is now the fourth, I believe. Uh, yes. Cut a promo on her, of course, because everybody has to cut a promo on the interview girl. She, she might, might as well be the world champion. So, in fact, more people cut a promo on the interview girl than cut a promo on Joe, who is the world champion. Yes, they do. So... She uh, interviewed him, and he mentioned that he had reached ungodly amounts of success in this country, which I'm still trying to figure out what he was talking about. <laughs> when and where? He said after 9-11, the Americans took everything away from him. Including his, his wealth? His comfort? And his family. Yes. <laughs> so. Did they deport his family after I, 9-11? What happened? Know. Did they kill them? I, I don't know. So, Maybe they're in Guantanamo. So then he said he was going to take it all back, and he might have to take some civilians, civilians down on the way. Right. Now, okay. all right. this is wacky, but the, the key thing established here, he mentioned he, he never mentioned 9-11 by name. He merely mentioned a heinous act committed by men he did not know and had nothing to do with. And then after this act... I could have sworn he said 9-11. He never used that term. Hmm. He's, he, but, he, but the important thing is he made it clear that he had nothing to do with it. It was not involving him and others... We're blaming him for that because of the color of his skin. So, okay. Or his ethnicity, or probably. His ethnicity is a better way to put it. So, then he had a match. <laughs> yes. And he came out to this match, and like most wrestlers these days, before his entrance, they played music. Sure. And Sheikh Abdul Bashir's music starts with, and I'm not making this up, <laughs> and I swear to God, I could never make this up, it starts with the sound of a plane going down. Yeah. So... Apart from the horribly offensive nature of this, <laughs> this this is one of those things that is so offensive. It's it not it's not offensive. Comical. It is. It, it's it's so. It, I was my feelings were not hurt, but all I can think was Jesus Christ, the balls of these men. It, it, it exactly. Is, it is so offensive that it becomes inoffensive. It, it, it's it, it, it's it, so in your face, middle finger, fuck you. Now that being said, no one I knew died that day. A lot of people know people who died that day yes. and probably weren't really happy to be reminded of it here on this fun time wrestling show. You would think. I would think. Yeah. That's the way I think of things. No one wants to be reminded of tragedy and despair and loss when they sit down for their Thursday night or to entertainment. That's just my opinion. What was that other thing? There was something else in wrestling. There was like an entrance video. Maybe it was his, actually. Or maybe it was uh, Muhammad Hussain who had the, the entrance video and like there was an airplane no, it was the it was the contest for it was like a Seinfeld contest, 
that happened to show an airplane <laughs> flying at, at a space right. needle. Yeah. That, was, that was Seattle only thing. That was hilarious. Although well, it, it did occur to me, I was just thinking of just, just jaw dropped watching all this unfold. I, I thought about Los Talibanis and, and CMLL who appeared like four that months after 9-11. That was totally different because they were actually making fun of, of the attackers. Their, their whole gimmick was they dressed in turbans and robes and were always trying to find their camels. Yeah. Which was offensive to the attackers. Sure. Yes. This was offensive to the victims. This was offensive to me. Yes. Yeah, when he came out and I heard that plane going down, I it was one of those moments where I was just aghast. <laughs> like, I couldn't even be mad. <laughs> It, just, it was just so completely absurd that somebody would think that this is a good idea. To, to, be, to be offended or to be insulted, your brain would have to be able to accept the concept that this actually happened. Yeah. Whereas I... I may wake up at any time. It's three hours later. I still can't believe it really happened. I, I made you rewind it so I could verify again that perhaps it was like a strange guitar sound that happened to start at a high pitch and drop. No, it's pretty unmistakably the sound of engines yeah. going down to the ground. Yeah. Holy crap. It gets better, of course. The Sheik is gigantic now. He looks about 20 pounds heavier than he was last week. Actually, I'm not done with that. Oh. I, 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 beyond beyond the offensive nature of this, beyond the, 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 has to how callous and cold that is, it also makes no sense. Because as we noted in the promo, right before this match, Sheik Abdul Bashir noted 9-11 had nothing to do with him, and he called it a heinous act. Now he is identifying himself with it. I don't know. This company sucks. Gets better, as noted, 20 pounds heavier. I've worked out many, many years, and I've never put on 20 pounds in a week. Nor have I put on 20 pounds in a week and just been covered with acne. <laughs> like a, like an armadillo. Like an ankylosaurus his back was. And in a completely unrelated note, remember those TNA drug tests? Kinda. Yeah. I haven't heard about them in a while. They tested a bunch of guys. You want to oh. know what happened? Did everyone pass? No, there were a bunch of people that failed. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Huh. Then you know what happened? What happened? Nothing. Went on. <laughs> nothing. Literally nothing. They, they just had drug tests. They, 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 they went to certain restaurants and said, well, you failed, and that was it. That is essentially what happened. It would be like if, I, if pressure were put on me to drug test you, but nobody actually put on any pressure on me to actually dole out any punishments. And I, like, tested you and you failed, and I just said, you failed. Right. So anyway, now let's do the show. That's essentially what happened. So, just so I'd throw that in there during this Sheik Bashir deal with a fucking plane going down in this godforsaken piece of shit company. So, then it gets better. Consequences Creed, who they just did a bunch of promos about, including talking to his teacher, he gets beat. Seems pretty goddamn stupid. Gets better. So he gets beat because Bashir used the ropes or something like that. And even though there's a fuck finish in, like, every goddamn single match in TNA, this time the babyface cried about it, and the ref decided to restart it. At which point, Consequences Creed beat Bashir. So, talk about neither guy getting over. <laughs> you beat both men. Yes. You now have two losers. You basically had two losers, and one of the losers is going to the pay-per-view to fight for the title. Now, with that said, as utterly horrible as all of this was, they did an angle afterwards where Bashir was angry at the ref and shoved him, and the ref could finally take no more, and he fucking fired up and cleared the ring of Sheik Bashir. This is Shane Sewell, the referee. This was the best thing on Impact in forever. And Shane Sewell looked like the best fucking worker in the entire company. This is the guy who, when I first showed up, I noted that I liked him simply because he looked like Buddy Rogers. And he wrestled like a guy from the that era. Yeah. He had just big, wacky punches. He threw the guy into the ropes, pumped his fists a few times, <laughs> then hit a giant backdrop. Shane Sewell rules. Shane Sewell should be wrestling every week on this show. Yes, please. And uh, then we got we went from Shane Sewell to, I'm just going to skip the Nash promo for now since I'm on a roll of good things on this show. Beer Money doing a promo. Hey. This was awesome. Plugged the video game, jumped up and down, slapped hands, whacked each other on the ass. And uh, it was all great until the uh, Shane Abyss, whatever the fuck the Brotherhood's name is, showed up. And uh, I here's what I'm waiting for. I want the Prince Justice Brotherhood on Karen's angle because I think the universe would just collapse. You think a black hole would erupt? I do. I think a black hole would erupt in the middle of the impact zone and suck all of TNA into it, and we'd be done with this place. Huzzah! 
My, my exact notes here read, beer money, yay, geeks, boo. <laughs> I was so happy when beer money was out. And as noted, they, they were so happy about their video game, and, and they were, in fact, slapping each other on the ass. And then James Storm said, stopped and said, wait a minute. I don't play video games. I'm too busy drinking. And Rude Ru tried to explain to him that because they're in a video game, they get more money so they can buy more beer. And then they're happy again. And I was all like, yay. And then in came the clown show. I just got angry. Yeah. How dare they ruin Beer Money's party? Yeah. Anyway, we had the Nash promo, and it was dorky. We we basically, they, they interviewed Nash, and they said, why did you slap Samoa Joe last week? Or what did you do there? And Nash explained that he slapped Joe to try to motivate him. <laughs> right. Now, for those of you that don't watch Impact, upon hearing a man saying that he slapped a man to motivate him, you might think, okay, that makes sense. Well, if you have watched the show, you might recall that Joe was doing commentary last week, and Nash was having the match. Yes. Nash left the ring to go slap Joe in the commentary booth to motivate him, apparently to do better com commentary. Sure. I have no other explanation. This was lame. <laughs> this was lame. All I could think is... It's like watching a guy and a girl who, who you, you, you're friends with both of them, and they, they break up, and they get back together, and they break up, they get back together, and you just don't care anymore. You just don't want to hear about it anymore, and that's Joe and Nash. Yeah. They're two lovers who keep breaking up and getting back together, and I just don't care about it anymore. We had Kip James and the beautiful people doing a promo. Basically, uh, Taylor and Angelina Love are going to have a beauty pageant next week, and I can't wait. That that actually is going to be awesome. Yeah. And, and it's the perfect logical, rational way to stretch an angle throughout the show. They explain there would be a talent contest, there would be an evening gown competition, and there would be a swimsuit final. So everything about that is a great idea, and I applaud that. Now, to this point in the show, if I am counting correctly, we had had four promos, or excuse me, eight promos, and one match. And the match was all about the angle at the end anyway. Yeah. This show sucks. Yeah, well, what the hell can you do? I guess you can talk about the next match. No, I got an idea. Do you now? Are you, are you adjusting equipment on the fly? No. I'm going to try something here after the impact report. <laughs> Since we don't have the drop board, I have a new idea for a gimmick. Oh, boy. <laughs> I cannot wait. All right. We had Beer Money against Shark Boy and Super Eric. Short. It was fine. Um... Hernandez ran in afterwards to clear the ring, then Homicide made his return with an eye patch, and that was that. And that was, by the way, as exciting as Homicide's big return was. He walked in. Yeah. He had an eye patch. I would guess that most people that watch his show didn't even realize he was gone. No. And they, and, and if you didn't watch this so regularly and you watched this one, you certainly had no idea he was gone. He was just a guy who just has an eye patch now. Yeehaw. And uh, the gimmick was, you see, it was supposed to be Curry Man in this match for one of the two guys on his team, but he did he never came out when they played his music. That's because Christy Hemming said she wanted to fuck him. And they were in the backstage about to do the deed. And a minute later, we saw uh, Lance Hoyt and uh, Jimmy Ray beating him up. And then his team lost anyway. Sucks to be him. Just a mess of television. Just just a wretched mess. Then we had Abyss coming out for a match. Team 3D came out and said that he'd offered a challenge to anybody next week. And he what, indeed... what a baby face, by the way. The first girl who says she wants to sleep with him, he, can't, he has to leave his job to follow her out to the parking lot. Sure. And then he gets beat up. Vince, if Christy Hemi offered to fuck you... I'm not a babyface. <laughs> I see. I am not respectable. I see. So, anyway, Abyss came out for a match. And, like I said, uh, Team 3D came out, and, and they said they were there to accept the challenge on behalf of Johnny Devine. And my question is, why did Abyss come out if he didn't know there was going to be a match? What was he coming out for? He anyway. mentioned something about him making an open challenge at some Last point. Last week. Sure. So he just came out and he figured somebody would accept? I, I guess. All right, anyway. that's uh, So they beat him up, and then Matt Morgan hit the ring, made the save, and uh, that was that. And there was no finish to this here, no rules, anything goes, street fight match. Sure. Of course not. Well, there's no rules, so why does there need to be an end? I guess a finish. <laughs> In a strange way, that actually makes a little sense. God, this show sucks. ODB faced Raisha Saeed. They said Kong was barred from ringside this evening, which, again, I have two things to ask about this. First off, if you can bar people from ringside for one night because you don't want them to interfere in a match, why not bar everybody from ringside for every match? 
Because Why you, would you want people to run in for any match? Because sometimes, Brian, you want interference. <laughs> All right, but now the second question. Let's just let, let's 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 look at this a different way, Vince. Let's say that that you you were in UFC. This sounds like a horrible idea, but okay. All right, and let's say that Brock Lesnar was also in UFC. Sure. Now let's say that you are a heel and Brock Lesnar is a babyface. Which is pretty much how it would go down. Yes. Okay. All right. Now let's say that you as a heel were in the ring beating up Amir Sadola, for example. <laughs> okay. And Brock Lesnar ran down to make the save and just beat the piss out of you. And they had to they had to drag him off and and a bunch of geeks came down and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Now let's say that you let's say that Brock had a match the next week. Okay. Would they need to bar you from ringside? No. <laughs> Why would Awesome Kong be barred from ringside in an ODB match? ODB ran in last week and beat the shit out of Awesome Kong, and Kong showed fear for the first time ever. The, the, the so barred... why would Kong be barred from ringside in an ODB match? Why would she be barred from the woman she is afraid of? I don't get it. They probably said, Kong, we are barring you for this match. And she so said, thank you. Now ODB won't kill me. Maybe. So they had a, a match. And ODB won, and then she tried to take the mask off for about ten minutes. This, the match itself was fine. And then the baby face pounced on the helpless villain and tried to tear her mask off. Don West noted that she wears this mask to do her religion or custom. But, and I quote, we all want to see what she looks like. Yeah. I don't care what Raisha society looks like. And it's not because I know she's cheerleader Melissa and I've seen her. I don't care what she looks like at all. Well, Don West does. Don West apparently has a mystery. He, he can't trust anyone. He, he can't see their face. But does he also want to know what Shark Boy looks like? Maybe. Does he want to know what Super Eric looks like? And then Awesome Kong hit the ring. I bet he does, actually. Awesome Kong hit the ring. Ringside, in fact, which he was barred from. And there was a big brawl. They laid out uh, ODB with a chair or something. And then Roxy tried to make the save, and she ended up getting killed and, and took an awesome bomb onto a chair, which looked like it sucked. And then they finally sent out security about four minutes after this brawl started. No, no, much longer than that. The brawl broke out. For, in fact, first, let's break down the whole thing. There was a match. It was not a terribly long match. By impact standards, it was one of the long ones, probably three or four minutes. Then ODB went for this damn scarf for like two minutes, maybe three. Then Kong came out and beat her up for like a minute. Then there was a commercial break. Five minutes of apparently just Kong killing ODB. Then there was a minute or two of Kong beating ODB some more. Then Roxy came out. They fought for another minute or two, and finally, finally, security came in. It took them like seriously. That if you add all that, that up, I'm sure it's 12, 15 minutes there before security got involved. Meanwhile, earlier in the show, you will recall there was a segment with Beer Money and the Prince Justice Brotherhood. When that got physical, there was a squad of security guys, literally one step off camera. If a camera had panned five degrees to the right, you would have seen the security standing right there. So that fight got broken up in one shove. This fight lasted 15 minutes. Of course. Why? Because it's TNA. There's no reason. There is no reason. Because it's TNA. Because it's TNA. I'll tell you why. This is what these people don't understand. The reason the women are so over is because they're different than all the rest of the bullshit. Now they've become the bullshit. <laughs> Do we really need 20 Nothing minutes can... of ODB and Roxy and Awesome Kong and Raisha? The answer is no. Nothing can survive long God in bless this company them. without the taint of suck being applied to it. Then we had AJ doing a crazed interview. You know, I have to bring this up. You're skipping a segment. I know you don't no, want to talk about it. I don't even... But you can't pretend it didn't happen. ODB went, ODB into, went into a restroom. bathroom, and what you think happened in there happened in there, and we had to watch it. I didn't. I fast-forwarded it. It's still I could p- take no more. It's still part of the show. AJ did a crazy interview about how he was on the road all the time, away from his kids, having to constantly get MRIs and such. And meanwhile, Sting was at home doing nothing. Apparently, this was supposed to make Sting a heel. I sat there thinking, I wrestled for 10 years now, in fact. And 
Actually, nowadays, the schedule that AJ Styles works, I probably worked something close to that style, at least at one point. I never had an MRI for my neck or my back. Back hurts a little bit, but shit happens. There's a reason for this. I do not pity AJ for the stupid shit that he does. It's gotten them all hurt. Nope. Okay? And if Sting is going to make a million dollars sitting at home or a half million dollars, good for you. <laughs> good for you. Yes. Why is Sting a heel doing this and Kevin Nash is supposed to be a hero? I don't understand. That, that actually is a great question. Even within their own show, two guys doing the same thing results in different... We're supposed to have different reactions. And then he had the great line. <laughs> this this threw me into a rage. <laughs> he noted that Sting beat him up last week, and he said, I shouldn't have listened to you. I should have hit you with my fist or something. And he held up his hand. You will recall that when AJ listened to Sting, this meant trying to hit him with a baseball bat. And when AJ Styles tried to hit Sting with a baseball bat, Sting countered with a kick to the gut and laid it out with a DDT. So what AJ Styles was saying was, I should not have tried to hit you with a baseball bat. I should have used my bare hands instead. I don't know if he meant this would be smarter. I don't know if he meant this would be more successful. I don't know if he meant this would have been morally acceptable. In all three cases, he is dead fucking wrong. <laughs> this dumb hick, or rather the guys writing for this dumb hick, know yeah. nothing. Yeah. You call this an average show. Up to this point, Brian, this is as bad as Impact gets. You know, I, I here's someone yelled at me last week because I thought last week's show wasn't too bad, and I think the way I look at it now is every show is essentially bad. So you're now grading TNA against itself. No, I, well, I mean, I, I I have now come to the point where I judge it based on how angry I get at the show, mm -hmm. and and on this particular evening, I just don't give a shit enough, so I can't get all that angry. So I, to me, it's just a fine, well, it's an I, average show. I got angry at this speech. I got th this speech. In fact, that just that one line most of all got me very angry. I got angry a few other times. This show is poor. This show is not what I look for in a wrestling program. Didn't I just say that like two weeks ago? This show just is not for me. I'm just I'm just trying to recap this in a professional manner. I'm, I'm trying to find new ways to explain what how, how shitty I find this. Yeah. All right. So then we had the AJ Christian match to determine who gets a title shot, the fourth person in this particular match. And plug in the video game like crazy. It comes out next week, apparently, and boy, have we gotten some reviews about that, baby. And anyway, they had a match, and, and the good news is it was, it was a pretty good back-and-forth match. Did a bunch of stuff. Of course, we had the ref bump. Frank Trigg hit the ring and clobbered AJ with a kendo stick. And then Christian didn't see it. This at least all made sense. Christian didn't see his friend get laid out, and he pinned him, so there you go. And it is now Booker, Joe, Angle, and Christian at the pay-per-view. I actually really, really like this match. It was a very good TV match. Oh, I should note, by the way, that AJ took a clothesline at one point and folded over his head and neck. <laughs> yeah. So that's why you get an MRI, jackass. Maybe he wanted Taking one. Taking bumps like that. Yes. And, and, and yeah, he's dumb. But it, I, it was a very, very fun TV match. I really got into it. The fans really got into it. Everything was going great. And then they just had to do a ref bump. They had to do a ref bump. But they had to do a ref bump so Frank Drake could come in. Because God forbid anybody actually beats anyone in the show. Yeah. God God forbid someone actually scores a win. So, then we had the... And, and by the way, <laughs> shouldn't Frank Trick be punished somehow? Only Kurt and Burker were banned from interfering. Anyone else gets fair game? What? Well, what? AJ's feuding with Angle. Cornette came out and he said, Kurt, or excuse me. Yeah, that, yes, exactly. You're right. You're right. Yeah. He just banned them. Right. He didn't ban anybody. <laughs> Why not? Because <laughs> he's a fucking idiot. Because it's TNA. There you go. I can't even get mad at all of this shit. So, let's, um. We're not done yet. <laughs> I'm looking up something right here. But I, uh, I can't find it. Talk a little bit about the Sting promo so I can look around. Sting came out for a promo. He acknowledged that last week the fans cheered everything he said. And he said that surprised him. He said it caught him off guard. Which is proof that whoever wrote this line was in fact surprised the fans cheered him. Which is proof that whoever wrote this line is an idiot. A retard. A simpleton. A fool. He told the fans that they want to respect back in wrestling just like he did. And he told the fans that without them there's no TNA, there's no Sting, there's no wrestling. So... Sting got back to the fans' good graces here, and he put the fans over. However, Sting noted, there's a percentage of fans 
who wanted to see Booker T kill, or excuse me, excuse me, wanted to see Samoa Joe kill Booker T when Booker T was helpless. And there was a percentage of fans who wanted AJ Styles to kill Kurt Angle when he was helpless. And it, and meanwhile, here, by the way, there's also a loud chant of Samoa Joe sucks. No, there's Sloppy Joe. <laughs> and there's also Sloppy <laughs> Joe. So, blooms off that rose, everybody. So, yes, uh, so then he noted that even last week, there was a percentage of fans who wanted to see AJ Styles hit him with a bat. A bat. And he said the fans should be part of the show. And what do you say? He said, he said fans are part of the show and fans should be a part of the show. But there was a percentage, he kept using that term, that wanted to be the show. And before he could say anything more, Joe came out. Joe came out through the crowd. He called out Sting and... Sting basically gave him the same offer that he gave AJ. He said, he's here, I'm going to hand you my bat, and I'm going to turn around and go ahead and hit me. And Joe took the bat, and he said, Sting, I don't need this bat. And he threw the bat away because he was going to fight Sting like a man, like a hero. And then I forget what Joe said, but he pulled out a club. <laughs> I, I don't need he this. He said, I don't need this bat, and then he revealed a club. He revealed a different weapon. Yeah. So, he's not a hero. He's a villain with particular tastes. Sure. And it's not even like, they're both blunt objects. <laughs> but somehow, his police baton, whatever the fuck that is, somehow that is greatly different than Sting's black baseball bat. Somehow, the baton is good and the bat is evil. That is how this feud is coming down to. Which of these inanimate objects is more evil? Yeah. So there you go, everybody. So That's impact. Ke- Actually, there's more. Kevin Nash, oh. Kevin Nash came out. Uh, he told Joe, "Hey, stupid, be a hero, fight man on man for once." And as Joe was distracted, Sting hit him, and then the DVR stopped. Thank Christ. So actually, yeah, we don't know if the pe- the people booed Sting or not this week because the DVR ended right as he hit him. So somebody posts on the board. Did the fans boo Sting after he hit Joe with the uh, bat, or did they cheer him? Which I, I he, expect that they did. He, well, from what we saw, he didn't hit him with a bat. Yeah. He was unarmed. Oh, really? Yeah. He <laughs> just hit him. It, we, did, we did not see it. He may have picked up the bat later. But what I, we saw No, he did was, pick up the bat. I saw he, him pick up the bat. Yeah. I see. As soon as Joe got a thing out and Nash came out, he reached down and got the bat. I missed it. So that. he did have the bat. I so. was wrong. Okay. There you go. This show sucks. It was not very good. To the back! All right, what we're going to do now, I've got a, a special guest that's about to be on the show, Jeremy Warnick. Some of you may recognize the name. He does columns on the front page covering boxing, and he was at E3 this year, credentialed, I believe, through the Figure Four Empire, believe mm-hmm. it or not. And he has all of the scoops on the TNA video game. Wow. We are going to get him on the line here. He sent me an email last week when we were when we were trying to have some entertainment here on the show and we were trying to prank call different places. He sent me an email and he said, uh, "Next time you you instead of shut up," he said, "Next time uh, instead of prank calling, why don't you call me?" And he added, "I'm not entertaining, but I am Jewish." And I figured, well, you know, we <laughs> haven't had Brent here on the show for quite a while, so. I don't even know what that means. It just makes me laugh. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I watched a lot of, da- I watched a lot of Daily Show. So uh, pretty much any Jewish humor just immediately hits me like a lightning bolt in my laugh. But I'm not entertaining, but I am Jewish. That That's comedy right there. So let's get him on the line, and we'll see how this thing goes right here. So let's uh, dial him up. And we have got young Jeremy on the line. Jeremy, how you doing? Young, dude, I'm 27. <laughs> That's younger than both of very us. Very young, actually, yes. Yes. I remember 27, uh, the glory days of 27. Now, Jeremy, we, we introduced you briefly wrestling. as the uh, the man responsible for the boxing recaps on the front page and, and the man who went to E3 on behalf of the Empire this year. And anything, uh, any other bio notes you'd like to tell the people? I don't think so. <laughs> Should there be? I don't know. What else? What else do you do, Jeremy? On the website, is that is that your your main? Uh, do, do you have a, a, a the a official nickname? title is boxing and video game correspondent. Okay, perfect. Now, now of course you went to E3 this year, and yes, I did. the Electronics Entertainment Expo. For those who, unlike Brian, don't know anything about video games, uh, I, well, I they changed it now. Now it's the E3 Media 
and Business Summit. I stand corrected. I see. So Vinny's also a dumbass. They kicked out the public, basically. Now, now we... Yeah, they did kick out the public. Because I talked to someone who was there, who I met at another event. He apparently got there because he was the, uh, a few years ago, because he was the assistant manager at an EV Games. Wow. Now, now you had, you, there was quite a couple of hoops to jump through to get credential. Is that correct? There were many, many hoops. Now, when you finally got in there, obviously the 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 main the main topic of discussion tonight is the TNA video game, and Correct. of course that video game allegedly came out this week. I I don't know. Apparently you you ordered one off Amazon and and you still have not received it yet. Is that correct? They sent me an email that it shipped today. I will have it Monday. All right. Now you've already played it though, correct? I I played I played a, a pretty thorough demo at E3. Yeah. All right. So so give us a scoop on the TNA video game. It's not good. <laughs> What's wrong with it? Uh, hey, explain this to a man like me who doesn't play video games, and then it kind of explain it to a man like Vinny who does. Have you ever played a video game, Brian? I have not played a video game since about the eighth grade. Did the did you play a wrestling ge- video game with like say a referee? I played pro wrestling, but I don't remember if it had a referee or not. Actually, it did in like 1986. It was okay. awesome. Yes, I remember pro wrestling with like the Amazon. I didn't play that one. <laughs> you were not. You should uh, actually. You, it's, you, it's cool. You may not you're not been, that old. You're, you're not, not been that, born that young, yet. But yeah. uh, okay, go well, on. I, I, uh, the first one I had was the first ones I had were on the Super Nintendo. Okay. I don't even think they had okay. Super Nintendo. No, when the, I was the, this predated the Super Nintendo. I played the NES. Yes. Yeah. I had an NES, but I, I didn't have a wrestling game for the NES. Well, that game is worth looking up sometimes. Yes, but, look up but, pro wrestling one of these days. But the point being, that game did in fact have a referee, and it came out approximately 20-some years ago. Yes. This game does not have a referee. And why is that? Incompetence? Uh, they, they said time was the issue. <laughs> I think the issue is they... I don't think they put in the. I'll give them credit for saying time. I think they didn't get the hardware up to the ability to put enough people on screen at the same time. I have not wow. seen a final build of the game, but I'm suspecting that you can't get more than four people, four players on screen at one time. So you mean four? Four? I, I, I don't know that for sure, but that's my guess. So, so when you played the game, there were never more than four characters on the screen at any one time. They never let me have more than two players on the screen, but they never said there could be more than four. I see. Now, now the other issue. So uh, that would that would be so. If you added a referee, you would have to figure out how to make a referee work with four other players. And this was too complicated. And that was that that too complicated. I see. Now, now. And, and the game I had back to the Super Nintendo, which was the first one I bought. Had six. Six in, in a Royal referee. Rumble. Uh, no, it was six when there was no referee, but four with a referee when you did the Survivor Series match. You I see. Guys out on the apron. I see. Now, now the other the other issue is apparently in this video game there are no rope breaks, for example. Yes. Now, why is that? No. no uh, the developer I talked to didn't know what rope breaks were. <laughs> <laughs> a clue. <laughs> it's a developer. Yes. Who, had never heard of rope breaks. That is that is correct. Now, now, when you talk to these developers, did you talk about wrestling, and and what would you say their their uh, their grasp of wrestling was? Mike Adamlyish. Really? Yes. Well, that sounds bad. Uh, I, I I would I I asked if if the asylum was in the game and received a blank stare. I'm sorry. The who, asylum. Oh, the asylum. Okay. Yeah. Yes. It, hmm. Uh. They asked me to stop using so much jargon. <laughs> Did they use that word, jargon? They actually used the word jargon. Awesome. What, was some, what was some of the jargon you used, like pinfall? Uh, rope breaks would be the jargon. Rope breaks. Asylum jar- would, would count as, as jargon. What about, like, Tomco? Uh, they knew what Tomco was. Okay, well, that's good. Um, but... If you start to ask about, like, different types of matches or stuff like that, they got very, very confused. Now, now, are there any characters in the game that are glaringly absent? Like, for example, no Samoa Joe? No Pete Williams. Oh, really? His move was they too absurd even for a video game? They ever, <laughs> what? 
<laughs> his move was too absurd for even a video game? No, no, no. They advertise on the box that the Canadian Destroyer is in the game, just no Canadian Destroyer. Oh, now, how about that? Are you, are you sure he's not, like, unlockable? Positive. He, he's been featured in the downloadable content. They, uh, they released a little video package that the first downloadable content is going to be him and Curry Man. Him and Curry Man. Yes. I, I, Shark Boy's in the game, though. <laughs> Shark Boy. Oh, Shark Boy. Well, I see. I, I saw. I actually saw the game at the Penny Arcade Expo last month here in Seattle, which was awesome. But um, the game looked oh, really yeah. cool for like a minute, and then I had done approximately 400 suplexes. I wanted to do anything else. I couldn't figure out how. And I had just. Uh, kept... That's because you can't. I, that's what I've gathered from talking to other people and reading other stuff. Is apparently the the. The list of moves in this game is pathetically short, and you will get bored with it within minutes. Wow. Yes. Uh, I talked to... I mean, the thing is, is I went in, and I had been critical of SmackDown vs. Raw last year, and I thought that like the developers were a bunch of guys who were just engineers who were told to go make a wrestling game. And then I went and talked to them, and these guys were about the most hardcore wrestling fans you could ever find. And then I went and I met with the guys at Midway who were exactly what I feared. <laughs> now, now, how does this compare, like, as far as graphics to your, your average wrestling game? Very good, bad, medium? Uh, Impact has the best-looking graphics of any wrestling game ever. Wow. Well, that's, that's a plus. But, uh, but there are some flaws. Okay. Like, they determined they don't need blood. All right. Now, have you actually seen episodes of Impact without blood? Not tonight, that's for sure. Certainly sure. tonight's off no, that there's, list. There's a lot of blood tonight. I, 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 there's more blood on Impact than there are on, like, five ships. So, they, and I think they, the, the reason they gave the public was that they didn't want to, uh... Scare off the kitties? Time. Well, they didn't have time, yeah. The, that was the reason they gave the public... The reason they gave me was that they wanted to make it appear appeal to children. Kids, you say? Do children actually watch that show? I hope not. I don't think anyone watches that show. My children will be banned from it. Uh, that's a real question, Brian. I well, um, that's a real answer. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> no, it's it's mostly eighteen Brian? to. Uh oh, did we lose Jeremy? Brian, are you there? We hear you. I'm here. Brian. Hello. Jeremy. Hello. Hello. Are you on your Hello? cell phone? Hello? This is awesome it, radio. It did something. He walked into a tin can Hello? a second ago. Oh, hold on. <laughs> wait, wait. What's happening? Jeremy. Let me call him back. Okay. Ah. All right, we got you him back. That some way so it doesn't sound so bad? <laughs> the no. funny thing is he didn't hit record until right when you started talking <laughs> just now. All right, we got you back. You sound all right. Um, as long yeah. as we don't lose you. We, we were talking about the uh, the lack of blood, and I guess my, yeah. my, my other question before we talk more about blood is, are the girls in the game? Only Christy Hemi, and she doesn't wrestle. She she's available in backstage vignettes and in like loading screens to give you advice on how to wrestle better. <laughs> A perfect job <laughs> this for Christy. Best game ever. Now, now, so so like no Gail Kim and no Awesome Kong. No. Wow. No, they're, the, that. they're the most popular yeah, yeah. people on the show. Yeah, they they said okay, what does. TNA Impact do really well, and they said, well, let's try and make sure we put as little of that in the game as possible. That's always good. Now, now Jeff, they're, like, we, they're like, we do really, really good brawls, so let's only put a steel chair in the game. Um, and again, that game I had back on the Super Nintendo has steel chair and the ring bell, um, and rope breaks, and, rope and a referee. Breaks. And a referee. When the rope breaks back in 19, whenever that was? I don't remember if there were rope breaks in pro wrestling, but there was a referee. There were dives outside the ring, and I believe there may have even been a table. Wow. <laughs> it was an in intense game. I guess so. Now, now there's a story mode on this game, and, and how, does it com how does it compare to other story modes, and uh, what's the story? I have not gotten much. I have not gotten any hands-on time with the story, but from what I can tell, it is very, very short. They are telling people that 10 hours is a typical story time. That is not that lie. If, if, if you get 10 hours of a story time and you are satisfied with that, you are easily satisfied. Uh, there are There's a game coming out on October 21st 
that's going to have probably a hundred hours of, of, of gameplay, and another one coming out on, on October 28th that again is going to have a hundred hours of gameplay. Why don't you go ahead and, and name those? Gonna, and what? Why don't you go ahead and name those games just because? Oh sure. Uh, Stable Two is coming out October 21st, and uh, uh, Fallout Three is coming out October 28th. Okay. I'm going to have a hundred hours or so of stuff you can do without repeating anything. And this one has ten. What? And this one has ten. This one has ten. And yeah. and what is what is the and I guess Jeff Jarrett is the the culmination of this story. Jeff Jarrett is the culmination of this story. Wow. Well, fitting, I guess, now that he's finally back on Impact. That's true, but if if you just spent $60 at the end of your 8 to 10 hours is Jeff Jarrett. <laughs> you don't think people are going to be happy? Some people some people are going to be happy. The thing is, is the reviews from people who buy the game tend to be positive because... People like to justify that the game they just spent sixty dollars on doesn't suck. Well, they don't seem and to be like that like with be, paper. And they don't like to be told that what they just spent sixty dollars on sucks. Now, that's kind of interesting because with WWE pay-per-views, people don't that find ways to to justify the, the money that they spent was well spent. Same with you TNA. Oh, did we lose Jeremy again? Let me switch off my headset. 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 That might be the problem. Jeremy, you there? Hello, do you guys hear me? This we, is the Brian Vinny Show is best. Guys, I think I lost you again. <laughs> it's not the headset, apparently. Guys? Uh, I'm going to call him back. Hello? <laughs> this only Hello? happens This only happens on the Brian and Vinny Show, I noticed. Why don't I email you guys my house number? You can try that. Oh, okay, I'll give you a call back on that one. Email me. Okay, bye. All right, bye. Well, thank God we were recording that right there. <laughs> we'll just chill here for a few minutes while the numbers float through the interwebs. Through the series of tubes and into Brian's machine. <laughs> the series of fucking tubes. Uh, welcome to the Brian Vinny Show, everyone, <laughs> where everything always goes wrong. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were done. <laughs> I thought you would hit stop. No, I'm just hanging out, you waiting just... for him to send me this thing. Yeah. People ask me sometimes, hey, you should get a job in real radio, and I always think, no. <laughs> I don't think they would hire me. What the hell's that have to do with this, these problems that we're having with his stupid ass cell phone? This is a, a classic train wreck moment. Sometimes, most train wrecks in the show are caused by myself. That's true. This one's really not, but it sounds like something I would do. No. That's my point. What kind of questions should we ask him when he, when he sends me this email here? Hopefully at any moment now. Um, I don't know. It sounds actually like he's pretty close to being done, is the funniest thing. Well. Hmm. Hmm. Do you have any other questions, Brian, about this video game or any others? <laughs> oh, here ask him go. about Dig Dug. All right, hold, okay, I'm good. I will. Okay, hold on. Let's get him on the line and I'll ask him about Dig Dug. And to be fair. All right, we've we've uh, got Jeremy back here on the line, and uh, what the hell were we talking about before we let you go there? I have no idea. Do you want to pause and play back where we left off? No, let's uh, let's just continue here. I got a couple more questions very quickly. Uh, first off, you ever played Dig Dug? Of course I did. Really? Yeah. One of the first <laughs> games I got. I, I didn't know if you were uh, you were old enough to have played Dig Dug. My, my friend Jim actually. Got, yeah. yeah, my my friend Jim actually has Dig Dug on the Xbox Live, which means yes, on his Xbox 360 he is playing Dig Dug. Yeah, it's a five dollar download. <laughs> and it looks exactly the same. Yeah, they did a really good job with it. Now, now Jeremy also. Uh, um, final, my brother final... got Joust on on his Xbox Live. Joust, you say? This is the one where you. Uh, I remember Joust. Flying ostriches and you. What about what about Cubert? They're gonna make that into a movie. What about Cubert? I, I, don't, I did play Hubert. I don't have it on my Xbox. They don't have it out on Xbox, but yes, I did play it. I have Hubert on my aunt's ColecoVision. All right, enough geeking out here. Uh, yeah. A couple more quick questions about the game, then we'll uh, do a couple... Oh, yeah, now I remember. We were talking about uh, Jeff Jarrett as the end boss. Oh, that's, that's right, right, that's right. And I was saying right. that people don't like to be told that something they spent $60 on sucks, which is why they get all upset. That's right, and I, I was making my point that it's funny that in wrestling pay-per-views, people have no problem talking about how upset they are that the 60 bucks they spent on a show sucked. I think it's because for wrestling pay-per-views, you watch them and then you're done. When you buy a video game, you play for three hours, even if it sucks, you're pretty much committed to playing this a lot more. That's true, that's true. So you, 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 it's not so much justifying the money you have spent, it's just justifying the time you are going to spend. And it stares at you forever and ever. Yes, it stares at yourself, reminding you, you spent $60 on me. And you now, think, well, I better play it. Jeremy, what other what other uh, um, 
reviews have you read of this game, and, and what are people in general saying about this? Uh, I've read I read the IGN review. I read the GameSpot review. Uh, I think a lot of them kind of missed a lot of the points uh, because they they don't understand that like they're so tuned into what to what video games are that they don't realize that pro wrestling has its own special logic that should fit into what a video game is. Except in, except in TNA. Well, yeah, yeah. but but it, it, it still should, it, it, but the rule should still apply, because like good, vi- this is what's hard to explain, is that good video games have logic that applies to them, and if the logic is good throughout, you don't sit there and go, wait, that makes no sense. Sure. Like the TNA game starts out, from what I understand, LAX beats you up in the impact zone and dumps you in Tijuana. <laughs> where, where you have been given a new identity and amnesia. Yeah. Correct. Now, can you think of some issues with why being beat up in the impact zone and you would end up in Tijuana? Well, it's very far away. <laughs> Long yes. car trip? I don't know about you, but if I'm beating someone up, I'm not taking them on a three-day road trip. Especially to Tijuana. No. Well, maybe they're just going to Tijuana anyway, and they just dropped you off while, you, while they were there. How about the fact that none of them are from Tijuana? Yeah, that was also my, that was my other point. Is, and, and also, if I'm being sued by, I don't know, people for being discriminatory towards Latinos, I would probably have, like, Petey Williams beat him up instead and dump him outside, like, a brothel in, like, Windsor. <laughs> brothel in Windsor, you say. Oh, I'm just saying, if I'm being sued for being discriminatory against Latinos, I'm not opening my game with the only two Latinos on my on my roster beating up the protagonist. Sure, and dumping him in Tijuana. Yes. Yeah, and dumping him in Tijuana. Despite the fact one of them lives in Brooklyn and the other one lives in, I think, Houston. Sure. And they admit that in, and it says that on their bio on the website. <laughs> awesome. Well, they've been I, and, fine and, job. And it's a lot cheaper to fly to Windsor than it is to fly to, to Tijuana. That's that's true. Now, now, I guess to, to conclude here, what are your thoughts on how this is all going to pan out? Do you think the game is going to be a success, a failure? Is there going to be another game? What's, what's going to happen here? I think there's... They closed the studio that developed this one because it was over budget, it missed its deadline, and it was pretty crappy. And oh, we're off no to blood. a fine start. Yeah. Yes. So I think that may give it a shot of existing for one more year because they'll just say, well, it was all those old guys' fault. Um, because I did some math. I, I talked to some other people, and we figured this game needs to sell about 600,000 copies at full price to break even. Now, I guess one of the recent observers said that TNA is in 900,000 900, homes watch TNA. That's so a very unfriendly math. If two-thirds <laughs> of their viewers go buy the game? I, what, what do they say? They're expecting 10% of the people that buy the WWE games to try the SmackDown game? Something like that. I don't have high hopes for that one happening. Well, uh, the thing is, is TNA has always operated under this idea that their fans will behave like WWE fans or that, like, wrestling fans are wrestling fans. And that's never, ever been true, and that's why the company has never, ever succeeded. That's because one of the reasons. Because their fans are not... Because wrestling fans aren't wrestling fans. Vince McMahon has made them WWE fans. That's true, yeah. And they don't behave like any model would, because it's not... TNA thinks their fans will do one thing, and I think they're booking partly shows that they think they will do something, and they don't like understand boosting? the marketplace. <laughs> yes. So this, this is another thing where it, it's kind of a money mark situation where, well, WWE has a video game, we should have a video game, not realizing there's not a population to support the video game. Well, they'll, they'll still make a little bit of money off of it, and, and if it fails, Midway fails, correct? Uh, it's not like the money's being taken out of TNA's ass if they don't sell 600000 True, but if the game doesn't survive, there's no uh, there's no future royalty checks. They ain't getting another game, right? I see. And I see. they they would. Pro- I, I'm not sure how long their licensing agreement is for, but Midway has the right to just up and cancel the deal. Hmm. So should Midway choose to do that, they're back at square one again, and they're three or four years behind. Well, and, we're and also and they've also now just poisoned the market to say because if. I just bought this TNA because if I just bought this TNA game and it was absolutely the worst thing I've ever played, and why am I in a few years going to say, 
well, there's this new TNA game that looks really good, and they marketed it really well again. Why do I believe it this time is going to be really good? Yeah. So they so what they've done is they've is they've you've lost the goodwill of the people, and you've also when you have because I mean, this has gotten more I'd say more people know about this and know about their actual product. I That's mean, sad. They know about this and and you guys didn't know about their actual pay per view. Yeah. I mean, their pay per view what they announced four matches tonight. Something like that, yeah. I mean, and I and the video game is more interesting. Well, I have a, a quick recap just before we go here of what I actually saw at the uh, the, the the pack show in Seattle. They had an entire great hall in the convention uh, convention center booked off just for the ex- for, just for the exhibitors. Just thousands and thousands of square feet of space, and there was the, a big giant thing for uh, Guitar Hero World Tour, and, a, and a, a giant thing for Rock Band Two with an hour long wait, and and World of Warcraft and Fallout Three. Just just stuff everywhere. And then way back in the corner. Way back against the far wall was one TV. It was like a 14-inch monitor with uh, TNA impact. I never saw a line of more than four people for that. It was right next to three machines with Mortal Kombat versus DC Universe for which the lines were stretching back, 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 back. So this game's doomed. Oh, oh, this is actually a good one. The Mortal Kombat versus DC Universe is actually pretty good. But I was I was at the Midway booth and playing it because the Midway booth was a clusterfuck. Uh, they're never having me back anyway. Um because I told them that apparently I'm off their email list. Um, but uh, the, I, I was playing, and there, no one was showing me the game, even though I was at... Like, there, there was a booth on the floor, and then there was, like, the private meeting room upstairs. I had to literally keep pausing my game for them to go get things out of the closet next to me. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't think Midway's in good shape. And it wasn't like this was once. Well, this was like four times. Even I know that. I know nothing about video games. Yeah, that that was not one of those, huh, I am a media person here trying to see your game. You are not showing it to me, and you are making me pause so you can get things out the closet next to me. So this That, that was not uh, impressive. Well, we're going to uh, wrap this little segment up here today, but I guess we're going to try and get you on in the next couple of weeks after you've actually played the game. I should. Uh, it's going to come Monday. Hopefully, I'll, I'll, I should have finished the single player in the next day or so after that. And apparently, I'm going to have an online match with Crumbly. Oh wow! Well, fuck. <laughs> YouTube that fucker. Yeah, I'll say. Well, yeah, well, we'll have you back on, and we'll get your thoughts on the game, and we'll get your uh, thoughts on, on how the finished product compares to the product you played and some final thoughts. So maybe that'll be next week or the week after. Okay. Okay. I'll talk to you guys. Well, thanks again for uh, doing the show today. We very much appreciate it, and uh, I'll keep in touch. Okay. All right. All see right. you. All right. We're back here. And uh, that was the TNA Video Game Report for those of you that have purchased the the video game, or are about to, or are thinking about it. Now you've got a, a another uh, another look at it, and we'll, we'll I guess have more in the next couple of weeks. So maybe we'll have Bergen on as well, and he can talk about it. Sure. I thought that was Derek Bergen. He was gonna kill me for saying that, but they both sound like the same guy. You know what I mean? I never you've heard, never heard Derek Bergen. Never on have the show. no. No. I should have them on together and uh, let them fight. <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, to the back. I love this impact, actually. This, this, I will say, okay, th- there's good news and bad news. The, should we do the good news or the bad news first? Good news, we'll be positive. The good news is, I enjoyed this wrestling program. I had a fun time when this show was on. That's all I ask. I didn't, I didn't hate anything. <laughs> I, I had a good time. This impact, to me, gets two thumbs up from an entertainment standpoint. The bad news, this was one fucking terrible go-home show. I don't care. I don't disagree. I just don't care. This was a wretched go-home show. <laughs> and to top it all off, now, the shit with the guitar and the bat and Joe and Sting, it's so nonsensical and it's so goddamn stupid and it's so back ass words that that people are cheering the supposed heels and booing the supposed babyface. It's an epic disaster. But with that said, at least it was something they were building towards. You know what I mean? 
It was awful in nearly every way, but it was a storyline. They were building towards the return of Jeff Jarrett. You know what I mean? Uh, yes. So absolutely. So as bad as it was, there was a, a method to the madness. Now with that said, I have never seen a lamer return. <laughs> I have never seen a return built up for so long that was so damn lame. At the end of the show, I'll just skip forward here to the end. The climax. At the end of the show, Sting came out. And by the way, after all the weeks of not being able to say Jared's name, now they're just randomly throwing it out. Karen threw it out randomly at the beginning of the show. Sting came out and said, I want yeah. to address Jeff Jarrett. You would think he would make his debut, and that would be when they finally start screaming his name. But no, they just at, 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 they started at, talking about on this show. Whenever they felt like it. So he demanded Jared and Joe come out for a roundtable, and Joe's music hit, and he was in the rafters. And, by the way, for any of you that have Gmail, I noticed that when I open up, when I view in HTML, it uh, it puts question marks all over it. Mm-hmm. Like there's a question mark at the end of every sentence, sometimes two. Anyway, that makes this very comical when I read this, this impact report here on the air. So, anyway, Joe's music hit, question mark. He was in the rafters, question mark. <laughs> he said he welcomed Sting to come to No Surrender, question mark. This makes his whole report ten times better. Because it it's like, this is the show. <laughs> it's one Jared. giant question after another. So anyway. Uh, Joe said, I'll be there. Oh, Joe said something, this, that, and the other thing. And he said, anyway, I'll be at the pay-per-view, and I won't be alone. I won't be coming alone, he said. And suddenly, Jarrett's music hit, and he appeared above the TNA set. And fireworks went off. There were lasers and smoke. The lame fireworks that we see on all of these TNA shows went off. And Jeff Jarrett was just, like, standing there. Hi! And he raised his guitar in the air, and he stood there. And his music played for, like, 15 seconds, maybe. And, of course, the director's a fucking jackass moron. So we got a really, really far away shot, then a really close one, then far away, then farther away, then close and far away, all in succession. So you didn't get one good chance to say, hey, is this really Jeff Jarrett or is this like a fucking vampiro with a guitar or some such shit? So anyway, after 15 seconds, to the back. End of the show. They, they did find time somewhere there to get a shot of Sting just kind of going, well, okay. Was this not the lamest thing you've ever seen? It was high on the list. <laughs> it was so lame, it was hilarious. Like, all this time, it was like if WWE was doing a parody of TNA, and so they had a guy play Jeff Jarrett and make his big return. They couldn't have done it this lame. I don't think. Between the shitty fireworks and the, the, the <laughs> brevity of the situation and and the, the million goofy shots of it, just high lameness. I don't think when Steve Austin makes his annual cameos in WWE, they don't mention his name, play his music, have him walk out of the ramp amid smoke and lasers, and then have the show end right there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure something else happens. Or even if he just comes out and bats in the cheers, it's something. Amazingly shitty. This <laughs> Jarrett just standing there in, like, acid-washed jeans and this ugly shirt. I just... Just, just a hick. No one could want to buy this show that's not a, an avid TNA buyer. Well, no. Well, duh. <laughs> I mean, as lame as it sounds to buy the t- the pay-per-view because you want to see Jarrett, if you did, you have now seen him. You've now seen him. He is back. He's back. Yippee. And he's going to be at the pay-per-view, but not wrestling. He's going to be there, too. I saw him here free. I guarantee you everybody's going to wrestle next Thursday. So, you know, you don't need to buy the pay-per-view. I don't even know what's taking place this weekend. We may not even recap it, for all I know. And, and <laughs> cool. <laughs> Actually, there is a match I want to see. But we'll get into it as we get going here. So the show opened, getting back, to take these things full circle backwards, the show opened with a promise that Sting would have Jeff Jarrett in the building tonight. And then they moved on. And I thought, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> they have been building up to this return for like two, three months now. First of all, <laughs> first of all, it's retarded that his return is not at the pay-per-view. His return is at the show. Second of all, they didn't mention this even last week. So if you wanted to watch Jarrett, you wouldn't have known last week and had a week to hear about it from your friends. No. 
If you wanted to see Jarrett, you had to tune in at the beginning of the show or you missed him. Yeah. So his appearance on the show couldn't even have added any viewers. No. Dumb. And then as I was walking around getting stuff for the show, they were recapping what had gone down and that the, the James Earl Jones guy says the last qualifier for Four Ways to Glory was named. And I looked up and Frank Trigg was on TV. <laughs> I'm like, wait, Frank Trigg qualified for Four Ways to Glory? What the hell? Yeah. This is a poor video in every respect. So, you know, by the way, how WWE does a video for the fucking scramble, which sucked. And you watch the video and you're like, wow, that looks awesome. TNA does their videos and you don't give a shit. You, you, you don't know what's going on. <laughs> and they, they hired the James Earl Jones guy away from WWE. Well, he is. That's not, I don't blame him. He he has a job. I do. And he I do. I'll fine. tell you why. Because he he was. I have this feeling he's very much like Vince Russo. In in WWE, he was probably edited. He probably Wait. had all of these wacky fucking ideas. Do you mean Vince David said, Sahadi or? Yeah, Dave Sahadi. Okay, I, thought, I, I was talking about the guy who does the voiceovers. That's Dave Sahadi. Oh, I thought they were different people. No. Well, so anyway. okay, go ahead. So uh, yeah, they he um, I, I'm sure that he probably had all these wacky goofball ideas, and they shot him down. And now he's in TNA, and like Vince Russo, he's doing every wacky idea they wouldn't let him do. He's got his weird poetry. He's got everything has to be dramatic, even stuff that's retarded. And the nexus of humanity. The nexus of humanity. What the hell does that I still even mean? Don't know what that means. <laughs> TNA is the nexus of humanity. It's so like we're gonna evolve and eventually achieve TNA, or kill me. <laughs> Well, that's really... I will not procreate. I, I believe Nexus means like crossroads. So when we get to TNA, we will either evolve, devolve, or die. Well, devolve is the answer. All right. So anyway, uh, Joe came out and said he didn't care. Uh, he said he didn't care as he was ranting and raving and screaming with a great deal of passion. Said he wasn't leaving tonight unless he got Sting's head on the platter. I think Sting's head. Somebody's head. So then Nash lurched in. And said, Joe may not care, but she, her, he sure as hell did. Said he'd spent six months of his life investing in him. And Joe said, as soon as you slap me, uh, you're next. And Nash said, look, I feel like a father with a drink and a cigarette telling my kid not to drink and smoke. That's the thing about Nash's family life, doesn't it? And said, he said there was no doubting he was world champion. But while he was looking for Sting in the Raptors, there were three men gunning for his title. And Nash said, you're right, don't follow me, but I have something for you tonight, something to prove you're not ready. How is this a favor? I don't know. I have long past trying to understand this storyline. Joe said, uh, he said he had three men for Joe to defend against tonight. And uh, when he was done, Nash said, rest assured he was, I don't know what happened here, I gave up. They, they talked for a while. All I know is that Samoa Joe's hair, he's wearing it like, His hair. Well, there's... <laughs> He had like a little like, like a little cow lick in the front or something or sticking up. And all I thought was Samoa Joe looks exactly like Bob's big boy, the, the mascot for the burger joints. <laughs> <laughs> He's fat and happy <laughs> and has a little cur curly cue on the, on the top of his head. He should have had a, been running out there in, in red and white suspenders with a platter full of burgers and a shake. <laughs> Are you laughing at me? You're laughing because you know it's true. <laughs> oh! All of the above. Why was Nash, why was this a favor? I don't know. I'm going to give you three men, and if you beat them all, you're ready. Well, if he doesn't, then what? <laughs> First, I will tell you I don't believe you are ready. God, this was retarded. But it was, I wasn't, a, I guess I am offended. <laughs> it's just the usual TNA stupidity. It's I just, can't get that mad. Uh, yeah. You're, you're and all these question marks and this goddamn reporter <laughs> throwing me off. <laughs> we'll just read it as it's written. Whatever All right. The, the, up next is the beautiful people. Nash said there was no doubting he was world champion, but while he was looking for Sting in the Raptors, there were three men gunning for his title. Nash said, you're right, don't follow me, but listen, I have something for you tonight, something to prove you're not ready? This is a favor? How? He said he had three men for Joe to go through tonight, and if he beat them all, he was ready? And if he doesn't? Joe said when he won the belt, he said he defended against all comers, so tonight he'd take this challenge? And when he was done, he said, rest assured, he was going after Sting? Are you sure you didn't just type stream of consciousness? <laughs> well, I always do. Actually, you know, put these in question form. The blonde interviewed the beautiful people about the beauty pageant tonight? Angelina said this was the first annual pageant? I can't wait?
The Abyss Open Challenge was next? Christian accepted? Why would he do this three days before a world title shot in his hometown? Guess he's a fighting baby face? These are all actually real good. They do almost all fit. The only thing I will note, the only thing I will note, is that uh, Lauren noted that Abyss's challenge was up next, and then all Christian did, Christian walked by and smirked. And I thought, if this is any other company in the world, Christian would accept Abyss's challenge. I fully expected someone else to come out here. Yeah. But it was Abyss versus Christian. Yeah. They did, it was not a swerve. I, I don't know why they had this match. <laughs> They it was a DQ when when uh, Angle and Booker T ran in. Angle's bigger than ever, by the way, so he must be feeling fine again. And then he grabbed a chair, handed it to Abyss, telling him to hit Christian. <laughs> Go ahead. I just laugh because Kurt doesn't watch TV either, obviously. No. You dumbass. Abyss ain't going to hit nobody with a chair, dipshit. We've been watching this show for fucking four weeks now. This is no mystery. Especially not a guy who is at any numbers disadvantaged. So, Abyss comes in and saves people who are outnumbered and then doesn't use chairs. So, Kurt Angle asks him to violate both ethical codes that Abyss lives by. So, of course, they beat up Abyss, and then Matt Morgan made the save and challenged for a tag match later, which would be himself and Abyss versus Angle and Booker T in the main event? <laughs> indeed, indeed. And somewhere in here, they also mentioned, as this here match between Abyss and Chris was going on, they started talking about Ref Shane Sewell and how he got any disagreement with uh, the Sheik last week and how because of this they were inserting the Sheik into the X title match of the pay-per-view and making it a three-way. And then they just moved on. And they mentioned it here, and there was a very fast graphic they ran when they ran down the card later, and that was it. Yeah. There was no replay. They did not. They, they expected you to watch last week, remember last week, and care about last week, and Fessy would now feel justified in buying the pay-per-view because it would be a three-way. Thank God you're here because I missed all that. Well, I was I was busy looking at all these question marks. And if you hadn't missed all that, it wouldn't matter. I think I'm actually going to publish this report with the question marks. It makes it so much better. So then we had the bikini con or the, the the talent pageant, the beauty pageant. Evening gown, talent and bikini. Talent. So Borash called out the Prince Justice Brotherhood as judges. First one was evening gown. Angelina went first, pranced around the ring. Don was actually calling it straight, which made it even better. He said in a muted tone, Angelina Love showing incredible grace and poise. <laughs> and there's this, like a, a three-second pause as Janae compared him to Donald Trump. So then Taylor went, and Curry voted for Angelina. Sharky said Taylor, and Super Eric was a tiebreaker and said Taylor won. And then apparently the rest came later. So that disappointed me, but this was fun. No, I actually wanted it to be this way, so it would be a running theme throughout the show. I see. So it would be something to look forward to and something to build up uh, over the course of two hours. So I was happy that with that part. The, the the Geek Squad came out to be the judges. Don West said they would be excellent judges because they are all about what's right. And the theme of the show was that Curry was just smitten with Angelina and just voted for her and everything anyway. But uh, I also like when they, sat, when they sat down at the table, they had a judges table, and they had little placards with their names on them. Super Eric, Shark Boy, Curry Man. Mm-hmm. Perhaps something drastically bad would have happened if they had sat in the wrong chair. But regardless, this is all kinds of fun. I especially like Angelina Love, who was a beautiful woman walking around in her evening gown. All I could think was, we need more beauty queens with shoulder tattoos. Then we got a promo with Sanjay, who talked about the ladder of love match between him and Lethal at the pay-per-view. And if Jay wins, apparently he and Val live happily ever after, even though she was willing to go with the other guy if she lost. Yeah. Bitch. And vice versa, by the way. Yeah. If Sanjay wins, he marries the woman who... Who would want to be with this woman? It doesn't make any sense. I bet she doesn't like Olive Garden either, so... (laughs) Useless. We got a new Karen's angle with Sting. Another man who clearly doesn't watch his program, agreeing to be on this. So, anyway, he cut his usual promo about how when he was young, he was in these guys' shoes, but even then he had respect, and he couldn't leave this business unless people respected people and all this and that, and asked him about Jarrett... And he said, I'll be interesting to hear what he has to say. And and Karen Angle, whose charisma has just been fucking sucked from her, just sucked from her, says, so do I. He said, I'll be, so do I. I'll be in my seat. Yes, so am I. Repeat, so am I. The, the other great part of this. She's is, so bad. Oh, yeah, it was horrible. Uh, but it was horrible in a good way, at least. At least it made me laugh. Again, all I care about is if this show entertains me. And speaking of, there was a point in Sting's little promo here. This is not one of Sting's greater moments. 
he uh, <laughs> was talking about how the young guys are disrespectful. And he mentioned that Joe was disrespectful for Booker T when he tried to kill him. <laughs> and AJ was disrespectful to Kurt Angle when he put him in, he tried to put him in a wheelchair for life. Disrespectful. Yeah. I think that's rather understating it personally. And then Steam became very, very whiny. T- ironically, whiny about not getting enough respect. So maybe he was trying to turn heel here. I actually thought Sting was great in this segment, but Karen just was hideous. Karen was still horrible. So then we had AJ calling out Frank Trigg. They went to commercial. When they came back, Trigg was in the ring, and he said he'd heard AJ was a pretty good amateur back in the day, and he noted that he was a professional MMA fighter. He did this for a living. He hurt people on purpose, you know, because TNA's fake. Wrestling is fake, yeah. Yeah. And he challenged him to an MMA fight at the pay-per-view. And said three five-minute rounds. The winner was the guy who got the submission. AJ said, fine. They shook hands. Frank said, not too bad for a little something. May have been pussy. I don't know. But anyway, AJ slapped him. They had an awesome pull apart. Geeks hit the ring to break it up. And I cannot wait for that match. <laughs> that that sold to. me on the fucking pay-per-view right Frank there. Frank Trigg versus AJ Styles in a five-round, or excuse me, a three-round submission match. That was so awesome. This segment was awesome. Thumbs up. That whole thing was great, and uh, nothing to add. I, well, no, you liked it a lot more than I did. It was fine. You didn't like it? I, I didn't. I didn't dislike it. Um, I guess I just don't care about Frank Trigg enough. Maybe this was the know. best thing on the show. Don't oh, there I disagree Vince. with you. There I disagree with you. We'll get to the best part later. Well, there wasn't a good part. This but, was the best thing on the show as far as building up a match for the pay per view. Fine. And I don't care about the pay per view at all, so I don't care if they build it or not. Maybe that's the problem. Christian did a promo backstage about all this stuff that he was going to do and how he was going to be competing an hour from where he grew up, where he saw wrestling for the first time and fell in love, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, this was one of the best TNA promos of the entire year. Yes. And if this guy does not leave with the title, he's going to WWE. That's, That's all i got to say. Could, could well be happening. That's but all I have to say. It, this, was a, this is a promo from the heart about how the, you know, he'd been living this dream for – 20 years now, and now he's locked in full circle, and he's going to win the title in essentially his hometown. And after repeating the phrase one hour throughout this, because it was one hour from his, his house, he ended up by saying it would only take him three seconds to win. And that's just awesome. And this is this If is this were stuff. a singles match like Christian versus Joe, this would do buys. Four-way, nobody's going to care. Nobody cares. This is Christian's years. just a guy. Yeah. But, yes, this, this, this is a fantastic promo. Fantastic promo, but these people are idiots. So... Then we had the bikini contest, and Taylor went first, and then Angelina went over to the table and stripped right in front of the judges, which caused Don West to say, and I quote, winner, winner, chicken dinner. (laughs) So Eric said Taylor won. The other two said Angelina, so she won that part of the contest. She she struck a, a, a pose as she removed her robe, and... Tanae, or one of them said, I think she's done this before. And Tanae started to speak, and he said, there's only one thing missing here. And I thought, a pole? And he said, a stripper's pole. Because apparently if you just said a pole, that wouldn't be enough information. You would have to clarify this. Maybe a Polak, if he didn't a Polish person specify. Perhaps a yeah. Polish sausage. Then we had the... All, uh, all I could think watching this was, Curry Man's whole gimmick is that he's he's uselessly smitten with Angelina. He should have just been watching this with one hand under the desk. <laughs> Jesus. So then we had Awesome Kong and Roxy in a bimbo brawl. If anybody can explain why these are still called bimbo brawls, thousand dollars, and I need a good reason. Because and you're not going to get the money, I guarantee it. Because Brian, apparently all women are bimbos. Why would you? Why would you be so proud of your women's division and then call hardcore matches bimbo brawls? Well, being in a. Br- I know Moose came up with it. No, no, no. Know? I wasn't going to say that. Being in a hardcore brawl like this is pretty dumb. They had a match, more heat than anything else on the show, really. And it was pretty good, except for the part where Kong went for a big splash, landed belly first on a chair in a great spot. And that somehow immediately led to her hitting a chair shot and the awesome bomb for the pin. So what was the point of diving off and landing stomach first on the chair? Nothing. <laughs> Just a miss a splash. God, I hate that shit. So, anyway, when she hit Roxy with his chair, it was one of those Sabu-style, I'm throwing a chair at you things, and Roxy took it with her forehead, and boy, did her forehead take it. Yeah. This opened up a giant, thick, deep gash. Vagina. It basically did, actually, yes, right on the, on the top of her forehead. And, and if this had been an a- MMA fight, it probably would have stopped right here. 
It was brutal and disgusting and gross. And then afterwards, they set up two chairs, and we're going to powerbomb Roxy, but ODB made the save and then randomly gave the ref a chair shot, and they asked how Tracy Brooks would respond to that, and I'd forgotten all about that angle until they reminded me. And there was no payoff. No. We never did find out how Tracy Brooks felt about that. So as you recall earlier, Nash said he was going to give Joe a big test tonight, three opponents, to prove he was not ready. So Joe faced Johnny Devine. He won in 10 seconds. Then he faced Lance Rock. (laughs) At least he won. This is part of Nash's plan. (laughs) To test Joe and prove that he's ready. I'm going to prove you're not ready by signing you to a match with Johnny Devine and Lance Rock. Yeah. So then after the second win, out came... About 40 seconds. Out came Tomko. And they said, boy, Joe's had no time to rest before this third challenge. <laughs> Tomko is fresh and rested. But Jesus Christ, Joe's been wrestling for a minute and a half. He can't be blown up. So this was more competitive, which was ironic because the one guy not under contract gives Joe the closest fight. That's a good one. So Joe ended up winning. and He finally got his win back. He finally got No, he got it back before Tomko he? left. Yeah. All right. I, I made sure to mention that in the newsletter. With a question mark. Then we had, no, the, that wouldn't happen, geek. Oh. So, anyway, they uh, then Nash got in the ring and said, well, I taught you all I know, kid. You're on your own. And they hugged. And they're apparently friends again. And uh, Nash is turning on him Sunday. Yeah. So, yes, he said this. You're on, yeah, I taught you everything I can teach you. You're on your own. He gave him... <laughs> You give him that wacky leaning point that Tanae described as the old school Kevin Nash salute. And then Nash went to the back and the fans all applauded. And of all the things on this show to let sink in, <laughs> this moment they chose. Joe, and by, by sink in I mean they were there for 15 seconds or so, but Joe kind of stood there and nodded. And, they, and, they, and the fans cheered, Nash went to the back, and then it just faded to black. They didn't go to the back. There was no other angle. They just let this moment, as much as they ever do anything, sink in. This, Brian, Joe and Nash being friends, got a, a it got way more time than Jeff Jarrett's return. Yeah. This show's dumb. Yeah. Just wanted to say that. Thank you, Vinny. And then, of course, we had the final segment with the girls. It was the talent show. And Angelina's talent was an oral presentation, and I was praying it would be on velvet, but I was wrong. So She would have won for sure. First part was a knock-knock joke. Yes. Knock-knock. Who's there? Orange. Orange who? Orange, you glad you're not Taylor Wilde? Ah! <laughs> Jesus, Vinny. That's the key, see. This is why this segment was great. The heels told very, very horrible jokes, and then had massive belly laughs, all three of them. This is what heels should do, is tell bad jokes and then cackle. And we had the second part, which was a poem. There once was a girl named Taylor who went to a school called Baylor. She scored first rank in the class of Skank because the whole football team nailed her. Ha, 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 ha. And they all laughed and howled <laughs> and pointed at Taylor. <laughs> anyway. There was more. Then Velvet said, Angelina said she had something that would guarantee her victory. Kip got on his knees, which disturbed me. And they all sang, row, row, row your boat. Awesome. <laughs> this is great. They, they did it in harmony, so Velvet started and Angelina joined in. And somewhere along the way, they got confused. They forgot who was supposed to go first or something, and so they stopped. And they just sang, life is but a dream. And Kip James, from his knees, thrust both fists in the air and shouted, yes! He was so happy. (laughs) I love this. This was awesome. Then Borash said, Taylor played 11 instruments and would demonstrate the drums. And she started playing, which caused Curry to get on his feet and dance, which made the entire Prince Justice Brotherhood thing worth it in the end. (laughs) And then, of course, they went to the judges, and Curry voted Angelina since he's smitten. And then Sharky and Eric both voted Taylor. So she won. And, of course, the heels went after her afterwards, clonked her with roses. And 
ended up with the Rhino making the save, and and that was that. This was awesome. This is so awesome. I mean, as 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 stupid and goofy and silly as it was, it all came down to this contest. Curry voted for Angelina. Sharky voted for Taylor, and then Super Eric paused, and the fans went so inappropriately crazy for this. <laughs> They so dearly wanted Taylor to win this stupid, pointless beauty pageant. And he looked at the fans, and he looked back and forth, and he finally held up his Taylor Wild sign, and people all went, yay! And it was great, and the heels were outraged, and they jumped her, and, and Kip fought them off with the, the with the drum stool. I was hoping he would just use the drum stick, the actual the drum stick, and, and ward them off. And then they ran away from Rhino, and the whole thing played out so beautifully, and because they stretched it out over the entire show, it got enough time to play out and tell a good story, and... This was the best impact of the year, just for this one segment. You care about Angelina and Taylor? I ca- I don't know. But <laughs> at the pay per view? Are they fighting the pay per view? <laughs> Dude, I don't care about the pay per view at all. It's irrelevant to me. I'm hoping it gets canceled. Then we had Angle and Booker against Morgan and Abyss. They actually got the heat on Morgan, which was quite wacky. And Abyss made dots tag, bunch of stuff. Devon ended up clonking Abyss with a chair lead into the finish. And Tanae immediately noted it was Team 3D against Morgan and Abyss at the pay-per-view. And I thought, it is? <laughs> when did this happen? Is this also new? I did this first time. I had it. no idea. Apparently he made this up as they went along. I, there's no other explanation. And then, of course, that led to the main event with Jarrett making his return in uh, the worst return in <laughs> wrestling history. And what more is there to say? They aired a video, music video, uh, you know, promoting the pay-per-view. And there were several matches in this video in which they did absolutely nothing to hype on this show. LAX and Beer Money are wrestling the pay-per-view, apparently. Wow. They were not on the show. Yeah, well. There's the, the X Division three-way. Not on the show. No. <laughs> anyway. Well, they can't get everything on every show. They only have two hours. They only have two hours. To the back! Anyway, everybody, let's talk about this TNA pay-per-view here, which there, there was not a lot to get angry about. No, not there really. There was very little to get mad about. Um, Nor was there much to get excited about. Well, there was nothing to get excited about. <laughs> well, the, the latter match I, I enjoyed. The, the, uh, yeah, yeah, the match and, and I, I like the opener. The opener was, was a, a fun comedy deal. That's right. That was fine. But it was a small, shitty building. It They were just burned out by the end. They hated the MMA match, which actually was great because that it had heat. At least it had heat. Some kind of reaction. At least there was a reaction to it. And we also saw tits, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> and we're not talking about Joe. No. So let's uh, get into it here. It opened up with Sting cutting a promo about how awesome it was to be back in Canada. Got a big baby face pop and people chanting, you're a legend. And then he died. He just died. He's... Just stop for a long time, and then he kind of announced that he was going to face the winner of the four-way, which was a three-way, by the way, since Booker T couldn't make it. And then he stopped for a while. Took Mumbled for a bit. Ever to spit this thing out. And anyway, long story short, he basically compared himself to Bret Hart ten years ago, and he was going to take up where Bret Hart left off. I don't know what this means. And he said tonight... Or he wasn't going to retire until guys like AJ and Joe learned what respect was all about. Yeah. Yeah. My, Even my, WWE has moved past Montreal. Not TNA. That's clear. That's very clear. That, actually, that was clear several times this evening. But my favorite part here was very early in the promo when Sting announced Stizzing in the his house. Yeah. And all I can think was, you are nearly 50. Yep. You don't sound cool at all. But uh, he, he he talked for a while, and he announced that... He, he did sound slightly cooler than you did when you tried to recreate his... Uh... Well, he'd have to. Okay. But, uh, yes, he he announced that he had signed a contract to face the winner of this this four-way at the next month's pay-per-view. And all I could think was, why? <laughs> what have you I done? I thought that question, too, as well. What have you done in the past, like, year toward a <laughs> world championship title shot? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. So Joe's got a point here. We'll get to Joe's promo later. But... That may have been the point, actually, but no one else got it. No. Oh. But uh, yeah, so he 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 mumbled a bit. He I did notice the crowd sounded really huge when the show opened, and then sometime in between Steen coming out on the ramp and by the time he got in the ring, the crowd had gotten quieter. And I don't necessarily mean they stopped cheering. It sounded like someone at the desk turned a knob or or a level down. 
And so turn the crowd down so we can hear Sting better, which is just bad, bad, bad production. So as usual, the production crew at TNA sucks. And then we had the announcement that Trigg versus AJ was going to be an MMA match under amateur wrestling rules, which explain that one to me, everybody. I didn't even catch this announcement. And then they talked about Hurricane Ike, Booker not being able to make sh- the show. They said they'd done everything in their power to get him there and wish their best to everybody in the affected area. So then we had the opener, Super Eric, Shark Boy, and Curry Man against the Rock and Raves and Christy Hemi. I never got a good explanation for why this is essentially a two-on-three advantage babyfaces match. Which Don West pointed out during the match. Yeah. That Rock and Rave could not tag Christy in, or they would lose instantly. Yeah, so way to go, TNA. So Curry tagged in early just so he could have a chance to put his face in Christy's boobs and feel her up. And then Sharky got in and, and uh, went to work. And Christy tagged in for a big splash, and Sharky ran between her legs and got the hot tag. So then we had the uh, the big comeback, and Curry got in there and kissed Christy, who now enjoyed it. Yeah. Apparently all all women in TNA are, in fact, whores. Well, Christy is for sure. Any any man, I guess, she just enjoys. So anyway, they... they uh, or maybe she just really, really likes Curry. Hit her fire crotch leg drop on Curry... Everyone hit a move, and then finally, as uh, Curry went to check on Christy, who'd gotten a stunner, as he was stroking and rubbing her, she was pinned. <laughs> and then he continued to stroke and rub basically her breasts <laughs> until they finally pulled him away. He was so blatant about it. He got his money's worth since evening. She took the stunner, and she lay there in the, the dead man's pose with her legs spread wide and her arms spread, li- spread wide over her head. And uh, he came over and climbed on top of her, basically in half guard. Yeah. <laughs> and just planted his crotch against hers. He placed his forearm over her bosom and stroked her face gently and has stayed there forever. Yeah. <laughs> Way to go, Curry. <laughs> I'm just I'm just doing my job, I guess, was his, his point. Exactly. There, there was points in here where, we're, like, Super Eric got to do his double DVD on both the Rock and Rave guys, and that's always amazing to watch. And there was basically lots of cool high spots with the uh, with the four guys, and then Curry and Christy doing comedy involving, well, rape. Basically. I got to cut you off here when you mentioned that double DVD. All right. And there was another spot here where where Sanjay took a backdrop onto a ladder. Anyway, every move I saw, I just was like, "You're back, buddy. <laughs> stop that. Well, the- just stop." The latter, oh, well, you mean you're talking about Eric's back in the DVD? Yeah. Yes. Well, he has done that move before, and I done I I've done backdrops before. <laughs> that is also true. The day's gonna come when that back's gonna go out, Eric, and you're gonna be hating life till you see the doctor. Then we had Awesome Kong and ODB Falls Count Anywhere. It was a Falls Count Anywhere match. They did some moves. They brawled in the crowd. Kong looked tired. They did a power bomb. I don't even know where they got these fucking tables. These tables have to be Canadian tables because they're just tough. And she Kong took awesome a, Kong. Awesome Kong got power bombed onto a table, which did not break. No, she's almost 300 pounds. She yes. couldn't break the table. Oh, and the table tipped over. She landed on her head, which was even worse. And ODB beat up Raisha, got an ear fall with small package, and. Kong finally hit a back fist, and after ODB tried to fire up, Kong grabbed her and ran her through a table for the pin. Two and a quarter. It was... It was fine. It was there. It was a TNA sort of garbage First match. First match was two and a half, by the way. I should tell you all this so you can keep track of a profoundly average pay-per-view. See, it's that, that match... Should, there should be a bigger difference between that match and this one. This was just there. That one I, I really enjoyed. This match I watched. I was never bored by it. I never hated it, but it was merely there. Um... The, the only other thing really worth noting is there was a point here where ODB, after taking a slam on the ground, uh, she got body slammed right at the bottom of the ramp onto the ground, and I thought, Jesus Christ, why? There's one why I was with you thinking about why would you put your back through that for no good reason. But later, she had Kong, do- Kong down on the ground outside the ring, and being ODB, she paused to slap her ass. And uh, Tanae sort of questioned why you would do that, why you'd want to anger Kong or incite her. And Don West says, well, that's just the kind of thing that gets her motor running. Lesbianism? <laughs> or yeah. just, just any ass will do. I don't know. I, uh, ODB perplexes me, and I will never understand her. She is an enigma. Christian did a promo similar to the one on Impact, but not quite as good. 
And that's actually a positive because the good promo should be on the free fucking show. Indeed. And not something that you've paid for. Then we had Abyss and Matt Morgan against Team 3D, which actually the the streak of profoundly average matches ended here as this was a profoundly below average match. They did some stuff. The people hated Matt Morgan, really hated him when he did the Undertaker rope walk. And you remember back when I was talking about the last WWE pay-per-view and the tag title match, which went on second, and there was a little bit of interference that led to the finish, and I was pointing out how it's the second match on the show. It doesn't need to be complicated. Yeah. You just have something simple. You go to the finish. No. This third match on the card in, in uh, TNA had, let's see here, uh, Bubba pulling the referee out of the ring, Johnny Devine hitting the ring, and clobbering Morgan with a chair, uh, Devine running in with a chair in front of the ref, uh, then we had a bunch of everybody kicking out of near falls. We did have a great moment where they were trying to give Abyss the doomsday device. And Bubba's fat, and Abyss is fat, and Abyss was on Bubba's shoulders, and Abyss did not trust Bubba, and so he wouldn't hold on, and Bubba got pissed off and was screaming at him to hold on to his head so they could do the move, and there was a long moment of of ridiculous hesitation, and it was fucking awesome. It was so bad that Bubba eventually had to set, set Abyss down, hit him some more, and then try it again. Yeah, his so. back's going to go too. Indeed, indeed. And finally, Abyss got a chair but couldn't use it. Morgan punched the chair into Devon's face. Abyss hit the black hole slam for the pin. And then, of course, Team 3D beat him up afterwards, hit Morgan with a chair, and put the chair on Abyss so Morgan would think his friend hit him, even though Abyss doesn't hit people with chairs anymore. This fucking sucked. Yes. Star and a half, and that is being so generous. <laughs> it was, well, as you noted, it was fine for a while, and then it kept going and going, and with each... New, with each new intervention, it got worse and worse and shittier. And the people and cared less. And the people cared That's less. That's the key. Yes, it was. And just... let me let me tell you something, everybody. I don't care how good you think your match is. When you are doing a match and the crowd cares less and less as the match goes on, you're no good. It's a bad match. Yeah. You're doing something wrong. And that was the story of this whole pay per view. In a way, the people it. cared less and less as the show went on, and in these matches, they cared less and less as the match went on. This one in particular, by the end, they had they they were just done and burned out. And the idea of the with the ending angle was Morgan thought Abyss hit him, and Abyss was like, "No, I didn't." And then Abyss like pointed to the screen and said, "Watch, you big jackass! You'll see I did not hit you with a chair." But Morgan was having none of it, yeah. so that was stupid. I also like at the very beginning when they were talking about how Abyss no longer uses chairs and. Don West thought the key to the match, the key to the match, would be if Abyss could find it in himself to use weaponry. Can't is he man enough to break the rules? Yeah, that's your baby face. P. Creed and Abdul Bashir for the X title. This was this was a, a hype for the preview video where they talked to more of consequences consequences Creed's friends, one of whom declared about P. D. Williams, that move he uses, the Canadian destroyer, that scares the tar out of me. Yes, the tar. The Sheik has gained 10 pounds since the last set of tapings. He is covered in acne. There was there grotesque. were a bunch of new physiques on this show. Yeah. We had Petey doing his Pescado into a Hurricane Ron, and everybody chanted his name, which... At least they were in Canada. That's what I was going to say. I was fine with that on this show because they're in uh, Canada, but what can you do? So then Sheik hit a superplex. Creed did a double leg drop. A bunch of moves near the finish. Petey put Sheik in a sharpshoot, and Earl was doing mannerism straight out of Wrestling with Shadows. That was awesome. And uh, he'd screw Brett, but he wouldn't screw the Sheik. So <laughs> don't let that guy back into this country. And then Petey hit the Destroyer, and Bashir pulled him out of the ring and stole the pin. It was a good finish. And, of course, no matter what company you're in, it sucks to be you in your hometown. Two and three-quarter stars. <laughs> this was – you like this better than the opener, huh? Wow, okay. I, did, I like the opener better. This was fine. It was a bunch of guys doing stuff really quick. Uh, it was basically your, your, your standard average TV impact match, except there was no commercial, so we got to see the 80% of it that we, we usually miss because of commercial breaks. So it was fine. Um, it was, a bunch, like I say, a bunch of small guys doing moves, and then they screwed the hometown guy, and uh, they got to see his move, but they didn't get to see him win, so what can you do? Taylor Weil and Angelina Love for the women's title Shockingly, two and a half stars. 
Taylor cut a promo saying it wasn't fair for Angelina to have Billy Gunn and Velvet Sky there, so she introduced her new best friend, Rhino. She just got him her pet. Tracy was there taking notes. And even though Rhino was there for backup, Velvet still hit Taylor with a makeup box to lead to the heat. That was awesome. I, I prefer to think, uh, what happened, what you said happened is correct, but I prefer to word it that Taylor found herself with her face in the Velvet's box. Taylor used the same roll-up she pinned Kong with, but Angelina kicked out, and Billy ran in to interfere, right in front of the ref, by the way. Of course, yes. Got gored, and as the ref was getting rid of him, Velvet tried to interfere, Taylor ran him together, Northern Lights suplex for the pin. Match was fine, and that's the story of the show. Yeah, um, <laughs> again, this is your basic impact match, something to write home about. I just love the, the stupidity involved, in, in, including Taylor's very, very wooden promo where she says she has a friend and then brings out one guy to counter the guy and the girl. And despite the countering, she still got screwed by interference. And Tracy, who was there, who is the law of the knockout division, that's her official title, is to enforce the knockout law. She enforced the law by taking notes. She is a poor officer. And we had the best match of the night by far. Sanjay Dutt, Jay Lethal, ladder match. When of the match won SoCal Val's heart? They, they actually said the love of SoCal Val hangs the balance. Putting her heart on the line. <laughs> she would, in fact, be in love with the person who won this match. Yeah. And then shortly thereafter, Mike Denny described it as one of the most confounding, confusing situations we ever saw. You don't say. Indeed. And that's not true, by the way, in this company. Sanjay now looks like a mini Batista. They did all sorts of, of cool spots, tons of cool spots, actually. Uh, they did a uh, ladder bridge, the backdrop onto the ladder bridge. They did the neck breaker onto the ladder bridge. They had uh, Lethal head first upside down in the ladder, and then Sanjay drop kicked his face, and all sorts of cool stuff. And then finally, they were up top, and, and Sanjay put him in a camel clutch on top of the ladders, which looked like it fucking sucked. And Jay tossed him off, but then his foot got caught in the ladder, so Val went to help him out, of course, teasing that she was going to help him. But then, of course, as they both started to climb, she gave uh, Lethal a low blow, and then Sanjay got the ring and her hand. She has gone heel. We had a classic TNA moment where somebody actually sent me a PM. Let me read it to you. Is it a reader or someone in TNA? Or? TNA pay-per-view fact. Hey, Brian. The camera pointed to SoCal Val 27 times during the match. <laughs> yep. And, in fact, they could not take the camera off of her once she turned heel to the point where they didn't even show the guru getting the ring. No. Oh. They showed the aftermath. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you want to show the finish? It's important to show the girl. Yeah, they're dumb. They're a bunch, dumb. A bunch of fucktards are running this company. I feel everybody. better when I just say they're dumb and they're, move on. They're just dumb. Yeah, the match... The, the match Let me tell great. you this. If you're the director listening to this, you're dumb. What more can be said? You are a dumb man. You missed the finish of the match because you had to show her for the 37th time. You know... You are a fool. Go on. We will get to it, but that was not the dumbest thing the director did in the show. Yeah. A, a, a significantly dumber moment happened later. But uh, the match itself was awesome. They actually did, in fact, do new crazy things with ladders, which I thought in 2008 was literally impossible. But there was a bunch of stuff here I had not seen before, so kudos to them. And they worked their asses off, and they, they destroyed their bodies. And after, I, I believe it was when uh, Lethal was laying on the ladder bridge, and Sanjay hit like a flip uh, flip dive onto him, and the place went crazy. And Don West said, for all these men, men are going through, they deserve to marry Val. And like three seconds of silence passed by, and he just said, well, at least have a night with her. <laughs> When he realized... Don was awesome on this show. Don actually. noted earlier in the match that marrying Val is not a good thing. And as noted, the match itself was fun. The booking makes no sense because if you're Sanjay Dutt and Val comes up to you and says, look, I want to marry you, let's screw Jay Lethal in this ladder match, which are you going to say? Are you going to say, okay, or are you going to say, no, let's just get married and I won't destroy my body in a ladder match? Well, they wanted to destroy his body. And that, that's the Lethal. best way they can think of it? Yeah. And if so, why didn't Val just help Sanjay cheat from the get-go? There was also a great Don West line earlier during the Petey Williams match when uh, Petey was trying a Canadian Destroyer on both guys, and Don just pretty much said, You're a fool. What a bad idea. <laughs> and, of course, he didn't make it, so I love it. I was so heartbroken because the only way to make that move even dumber is to do it on two guys yeah. at once. Just, just 
shatter the laws of physics. A black hole may have opened up in Canada if he had pulled this move off. He also was talking about Sanjay's back, and he said it was red and covered with welts. And I thought, those are zits, Don. <laughs> those are zits. Get it straight, buddy. He, he's in, well, he's in good shape, but his back was hideous. Then we had Borash interviewing Angle, and the best part of this was when he basically said that it was because of Jeff Jarrett that he lost his gold medals, and I just thought, I forgot all about that angle. <laughs> I remember him losing the medals. I remember that, but did they I do don't, anything afterwards? Uh, AJ wore them once. <laughs> Where the fuck are the medals? <laughs> Somewhere in AJ's home in, in Atlanta or wherever the hell he lives, but uh, yeah, uh, I, 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 said, I just sat there, I was stroking my chin thinking, okay, I remember AJ won the medals. What the hell did Jeff Jarrett have to do with it? I... I know he guitar. wasn't there. I know they didn't name him. Then we had Beer Money and LAX for the tag titles. And this this started out all right, but then it broke down into just complete it overbooked fell absurdity. completely apart by the end. Homicide, I, I love both these teams, but it did. Homicide got a hot tag, four-way, a bunch of stuff. Jackie took the rap, Storm spit beer in Hernandez, which the camera missed again. Hernandez hit a dive, which the cameras missed again. Jackie threw powder in Hernandez's eyes. Root hit the uh, Root hit the fisherman suplex, and just too much, just too much stuff. It, it, was, it was a colossal mess. They they got the heat on Hernandez, and there was no like big move. You know, there was no boy. They got the heat on him now. They just after a while were double teaming him. And I thought, okay, they have the heat on Hernandez. And I thought, well, he's the big guy, so they'll work him over for a little bit. Then to give him the hot tag, they really get the heat on Homicide. Wrong. No. They just beat up the giant for a long time. And they did their su- double suplex beer money spot, which is always great. And then Homicide, or excuse me, Hernandez made a decidedly not hot tag to Homicide. He made a comeback that no one cared about. And then he got cut off. And then Hernan- Hernandez came back in and he ran wild for a bit. And then he got cut off. And it was just a bunch of stuff leading up to the finish. And, and th- th- this again was doing fine and then went steep down a steep, steep slope and, and just crashed at the bottom. Then we had, where's my notes right here? The real highlight of the oh, show. Oh, this was awesome for a number of reasons. Frank Trigg and AJ Styles in an MMA match. Now, of course, I was very much looking forward to this match, and in some ways it delivered. Not in the way that it was intended to, but it delivered. So first Trigg cut an anti-Canada promo. I will say this real quickly. UFC needs to adapt to the pre-match promo. Yes. The post-match promo's got to go. Yeah. Give me pre-match promos of guys talking shit about each other. AJ came out. They said the only way to win was via knockout or submission. They had rope breaks, however. AJ was throwing jabs, which was the extent of his stand-up, and I think a couple of kicks later. Trigg had tag radio and assorted sponsors on his trunks, which was awesome. So about, I don't know, three minutes into this match, the fans just got really pissed. And with a minute left, they were chanting, we want awesome, or we want wrestling. And then they were they chanting, wanted awesome too. fire Russo, which I can't even blame Vince Russo for this. No. I, this, I, I don't know who to blame for this. But I, I blame the fans. How could you not chant fire Russo during other points on this show? Like the uh, wedding ring on a pole match? The, or the, 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 the wedding ring finish match where a, a woman let her fiancé kill himself for no reason, which she could have just helped him at any time, but chose to wait until after his body had been destroyed or any of that stuff. No, they, they chose this, which was perfectly acceptable, worked MMA. Well, I wouldn't go that far. You didn't like it as much? No. Well, I, 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 I've, I've actually seen great worked MMA, and this was not it. I see. But the point was, there was a great spot right at the end where AJ tried a flying arm bar and got the arm extended right as the first round ended. That was pretty cool. So all of a sudden, the show died. And I don't mean the quality went away. The screen went blank, and the audio went off, and we found ourselves staring at an empty TV. Black screen. And we watched it, and watched it, and watched it, and I went on the board, and I noticed in the thread, somebody posted, did somebody pull the plug? And I thought, that would be nice after six years. And I watched it, and it remained black. We turned the channel for a bit to see if it was... Turn all of TV or just this pay-per-view? Turn the channel and then turn back and it was still black. And then all of a sudden a picture return. And what should I see but an Asian with giant boobs. And her brunette friend. Making out with her friend. Yeah. Nude. Yeah. It's Unfortunately, just... this lasted for approximately one second before I saw the angry face of Samoa Joe. Such a bad trade. 
And <laughs> poor, poor trade. What was it that one time? There was something that happened one time where something got screwed up, and again I saw boobs, and then they cut immediately to Gene Snitsky. <laughs> you remember this? I, you remember this? I had a tape, and I, I, I taped what over. What was por- it? I, I taped over porn for Raw. And <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> it was like, you no, said, it was it was uh, it was fucking. Um, or no, no, it was it was CMLL. Because it was one of uh, Los Guapos. It was uh, the ugliest one. That's right. It was all I, I taped over porn is that you said, hey, record Lucha. And I said, okay. So I hit record after that changed the channel. Is that what you did? Yeah, because it was, it was no, all. No, I think you taped over porn. You sure? Because as soon as I popped the tape in, I saw porn for like a good 10 seconds. And then all of a sudden there was a close-up of Emilio Charles Jr. <laughs> That's right. That's what it was. That was years ago. That was no buys is what that was right there. This was similar, but not quite as bad. So anyway, then uh, when we came back, all of a sudden, AJ was just beating the hell out of him with a kendo stick, and the match was over. I have no earthly idea what happened. I do know that AJ had a huge shiner, and he immediately went to the announcer's table and screamed that he was a wrestler and didn't do this bullshit. And then he stormed off extremely upset, and that was the end. I suspect. Awesome. This whole thing was awesome. (laughs) Train wreck devastation. I I, I suspect. Actually, that's a horrible thing to say now, but... Um, what's a better term? Clusterfuck? A clusterfuck. This was a, a complete clusterfuck. A complete clusterfuck. Uh, this was, I think, and again, I missed most of this, so I can't say for sure, but I think this was supposed to be one of Vince Russo's famous worked shoots, wherein he convinced Frank Trigg, well, he convinced AJ Styles to take a punch to the eye from Frank Trigg, and then quote-unquote go crazy and shoot on him with a stick. And then go to the desk and announce, I am a fake wrestler, not a real fighter, and leave. Wow. This just has bad idea written all over it. Now, perhaps if I had seen the entire segment, I would not feel this way. Perhaps in, in entirety in, or in, in, in the whole, it made more sense than that. But from what a little I saw, that's the impression I got. And then, of course, the main event was Joe, Christian, and Angle for the title. Sting came out before the match. Joe confronted him and immediately slapped him. They got into a brawl. Geeks and AJ broke it up. We never saw Sting again. Oh. Earl had it was no great because was... Sting came. They, they went to face to face, and Sting said, "Go ahead, hit me." And Joe said, "Okay," and yeah. hit him. And so Sting said, "Do it again." And Joe said, "Okay," and then again. All right, quiet down. So Earl Habner was referee. Everybody um, booed him. They had a match. Not a lot of heat early, and it only got worse. There were a couple of pops here and there, like when Christian made a run in during the match um, after being out for a while, and. They did a stacked up stupid plex, and Christian almost killed himself landing on his neck. And there was a "This is awesome" chant, which made me irate. And that it was towards the end. And I, for a while, I was thinking again: Is this crowd dead, or is it just horribly might? Because Angle was seeing the angle slam, and no one cared. They put the ankle lock, and nobody cared. And I thought, okay, they always pop for these moves. This was just be horrible miking. Then he applied a double ankle lock, and the fans went crazy. So yeah. I knew, no. In fact, they didn't care about anything. No. And then Joe hit a big uh, corkscrew plancha onto both guys. That's when the this is awesome chant started. And Joe stood there and sneered at them like, no, it's not, and I know it. There are about 50 people chanting this is awesome yeah. in the entire building. And finally, Angle hit Christian with a chair shot. Sent him over the top. Christian landed on his hip, which I guarantee will be replaced by 50, mark my words. And then Angle hit Joe with a chair, put him in the ankle lock. Jeff Jarrett came out. Moseyed out. Hit Just Angle. With sauntered a, on down the ring. Hit Angle with a guitar, bad neck and all. And then Joe hit the muscle buster for the pin. And the people were booing Samoa Joe like crazy here as he went for his finish and got the pin. So, uh, failure. Was, this main event was a failure on pretty much every level, quite <laughs> frankly. It was, yeah, it was, it was, yeah. And no uh, Sting. We never saw him again. Sting never showed up again. Uh, Don West had mentioned, well, Sting is playing my games to Joe, and Sting gets the title shot of the next pay-per-view. It, he must not want to face Joe. He must be afraid of Joe. And Mike said, no, I don't think that's it. <laughs> I don't think that's what's happening here. But Don was adamant about this, and... They did their wacky little match, including spots where here in this three-way, there would be two guys doing a chin lock in the middle of the ring while another guy just laid there on the floor. Lots of inaction here and total nonstop action. And and then Jared came out with the finish, and the camera cut to the entrance before Jared came out. That's always a good one. And uh, he, he came out in no hurry as uh, Joe was in the ankle lock and just came on down the ring and hit Kurt with a guitar. And people were cheering for Jeff. When, when he came out, they cheered for him. When he hit Kurt, they cheered for him. And then when they realized he was helping Joe and not Christian, that's when they started to boo. So they came all this way to see their hometown guy win, and instead he was laying on the floor as the fat guy pinned Kurt. 
And then the show just ended. All right. Before we wrap it up today, this is from Dave, who's at the show live. Not that Dave. Different Dave. Just got back from the show. I read in Dave's review that they announced after Sting's promo that Booker wouldn't be there. The screen was blank in the arena. We didn't get this announcement. When the match started, people in the crowd were asking where Booker was. Oh, there was a point here where the fans were chanting, we want something, and I couldn't make it out, and I decided they were just too bored to even complain in unison. But apparently, perhaps they were chanting, we want Booker. I haven't watched TNA in forever, but thought I would go since it is local. I'm a huge ROH fan. Didn't think I would go to this first, but figured it wasn't really into it. When there, I could at least try to be amused or interested by watching the crowd. As you could guess, I was mostly just interested by watching the crowd. Pretty much all of the acts on the show were really over, and the crowd was really appreciative of having a pay-per-view. I can recognize that even though it wasn't my favorite kind of show, Oshawa is a great town for TNA. So apparently the miking may have been bad. That's always a possibility. Ladder match was really over, as were both Beer Money and Christian. A lot of people were wearing T-shirts for Beer Money and Christian. The worst part of the night was the MMA match. AJ was coming out, or AJ was over coming out, but people crapped on this. Loud chance of We Want Wrestling, Fire Russo. There was also a smaller chant of UFC sucks. And I even heard someone yell, We want the fake stuff. The crowd was into the show, but seemed stuck in 2001 and before with chants of, we want tables, you fucked up, what, and of course, you screwed Brett. So, there you go. There's your live report from the show. To the back! All right, we are back here on the venerable Brian and Vinny show, and we have got Jeremy here on the line, who's going to talk more about the TNA video game. You, of course, were on last week, and you had been at the, what the hell do they call that thing? Uh... The E3, E3 Business and Media Summit. That's right. You'd been at E3, and yes, you uh, got a chance to play the game, and uh, now the, the game has arrived. You ordered it on Amazon. It took like a full week to get there. And after playing the game, what do you think about it? I think there was more wrong with it than I even knew at E3. Um, <laughs> it looks good on the surface, but when you actually get inside and play it more, it doesn't really work. The game doesn't work? No, it's barely functional. Um, (laughs) Wrestlers pass through other wrestlers frequently. Uh, Like magic? Basically like magic. I attempted a drop kick off the top rope and flew through my opponent. (laughs) And did not not connect the drop kick. (laughs) He no-sold it? (laughs) It... He he no sold it. He I don't even think it landed. Uh, he was getting up or something. And that, also, the wrestlers do not wrestle like themselves. Kevin Nash, when I got he was he you play him very late in the game. Is the fastest is one of the fastest guys in the game. Okay, that's awesome actually because I have a when bunch. He, of, he he greased some palms then to get his speed rating up. <laughs> oh, wait, the thing is, the game does not have ratings on wrestlers. They just kind of. Do what they do, and when and when Dash came off the top rope with the with the baseball drop kick, then I was like, okay, <laughs> I was like this this is not this is not working. This it doesn't it does not resemble the product, and you can't. They have managed to create a wrestling game that does not resemble wrestling. It does resemble Impact in that every match your opponents are required to kick out of your finisher at least once. Excellent. <laughs> now, 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 let me ask a question here about the game because um, when you mentioned that, that these wrestlers don't wrestle like themselves and that Nash is grease lightning and such, I, I guess my question is, would you want to play this game if Nash wrestled like himself? It would at least feel more real. Sure. And the thing is, it, 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 you would want to play some of the guys. It, it just feels weird. It all reminds you that the game is not... The new theory in gaming is to make games that are more realistic. Sure. Um, NHL 09, is, I think, just came out, and they have it so advanced that you can simulate playing the backup goaltender. So you essentially just sit on the bench for the entire 60 minutes. <laughs> and you're paying for this. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you, this, you get together your friend, you get together your 20 friends and you play the online game 
where you sit on the bench for 20 minutes or for 60 minutes. Well, can wow. you at least talk smack to your friends? Yes, if you have if you have your headset. That's a game for me right there. <laughs> to yeah, sit back, do, do nothing, and make fun of everybody else. Yes. And the other guys have to – and when there's a line change, they have to go sit on the bench too. And when you commit a penalty, you have to sit in the penalty box. And you have to sit there for two minutes, <laughs> just not able to do anything. Okay, this game is awesome. <laughs> wow. I got a chance to play it. It was at EA. It was a lot of fun. Now, now, shouldn't the fact that the TNA game is not realistic be realistic? Because <laughs> um, TNA is so absurd. It, it would, except it's absurd to a level that, at all times, it reminds you of how fake it is. Because, like, falling off the Ultimate X structure, yeah, you just bounce back up. Wait, hold on a second. You fall 20 feet and bounce back up to the structure? No, no, no. You you just stand right back up and keep going. Oh, I see. Okay. That's a shame. So there's no brings me to flubber. So there's no selling in this game. There is. They have a little bar, and it, they determine once you hit a certain amount, you should stay down. But until you hit that amount, everything counts the same. So falling the 15 feet off the the cable is the same as getting hit with a punch. Wow. And yeah. similarly, so therefore also when you get hit with a, say, kick to the stomach, you, at the right point, you also sell that for 15 seconds. I see. Well, that's So, that's uh, like, you would backdrop a guy out of the ring and Monstrous. then hit him with a flying elbow off the top rope. Yeah. And that would, of course, end his amount of time that he's required to sell, so then he would get up. I see. I see. Now, now um, the game you, you seem to uh, so so basically you essentially feel the game would have been better if it had perhaps been finished, and of course the the rumor is that the game essentially was not finished and and uh, and shipped out. And, and is there have you heard anything about why such a thing occurred? They ran out of money. I mean, the game is about two years away from being finished. Two years? And I talked that, yeah, about two years. I mean, it's 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 not close to done. Huh. I mean, it, it, uh, I I they said there was a lot of things they wanted to put into the game, and I asked them at E3 why they just did not hold the game to get it done correctly, and they said it was not in their SKU plan, which is video game talk for we ran out of money, so we're just going to ship it now anyway, even though it's not that good or done. Hmm. And so they just shipped it anyway. Well, a couple of so, further, a couple more questions here before we wrap it up today. First off, now that the game is out and a lot of people have gotten a chance to play it, what kind of reviews are you hearing? Are people generally agreeing with what you're saying, or are you in the minority here and people think this is like some awesome game? I think I'm in the majority that people don't like it. I, but I think a lot of video game critics look at wrestling games as their own specific genre of they don't need to be held to the standards of other video games. They go, wrestling games are kind of bad, so therefore, kind of they get grade on a curve. They say it's just a wrestling game. It can't be that good anyway. It's much like Impact, that grade on a curve. Exactly. All right. Now, the, the final question here is, now that you've had a chance to play the game, and as you noted, it's it's it seems to you to be two years, uh, two years prior to being finished. It was it was shipped out. Do you feel that the that the reviews and and uh, the game as it is right now is going to badly hinder sales of future Impact versions of this game? I think so because if you buy this and you realize that it's annoying and not fun, I would have a hard time buying a second one. I mean, it, it, playing it through is not satisfying. It, the difficulty is punishing, and going through all of it is not rewarding. So have I you, don't have you, see why anyone would buy a second. Have you beaten the game yet? I have beaten the game. Wow. Now a lot of a lot of people I noticed made comments that it's it's really tough to figure out how to play this damn game. It the thing is is they only give you so many moves, and they punish you if you keep doing the same move. 
<laughs> that's oh, very excellent. that's very unlike <laughs> TNA. Come on now. So therefore, you only have five different suplexes. Mm-hmm. So therefore, if you repeat the same suplex, it doesn't work as well. Huh. So, but if you only have five. So basically, the computer tells you you have already done rock. You must do scissors or paper. Yes. I see. But and and if you do scissors or paper, then you, and if you do them, then the computer will counter it. Oh, well, naturally, because it knows what's coming next. That makes sense. Exactly. Yes. And they counter it at a superhuman ability, and their and their moves do more damage than yours. Also, they have determined that every generic character in the game should be Chris Saban. <laughs> that could be worse. <laughs> Could be and, Nash. And, what? Could be Nash, for example. I don't know what it says about Chris Saban, but they they included jobbers in the game. But Christopher Daniels is in the story mode, but you never face him or Scott Steiner. Hmm. You get to a match where you get to challenge uh, Christopher Daniels, and then he gets jumped from behind, and you, there's never actually a match. It is impact. Well, how about it? It is absolutely impact. Stories, storylines don't go anywhere. Matches, advertised matches don't happen. Yeah. Well, there you go. Uh, Jeremy, thanks again, and I'm yeah. sure we'll have you on at some point with another follow-up or or news on whatever's going on. So. Well, we, we should discuss the WWE again. All right. We'll uh, we'll do that next time. Okay. All right. Thanks again. Bye. Yeah. Bye. All right. See you. There you go, everybody. The latest on the TNA video game. It went smoothly. It did go smoothly. Just had to uh, get everybody up to speed on on what the hell was going on because we had a lot of questions about that and it was a very popular segment last week. So did it again. Yeah, that's how we roll here. Because what we do best is listen to suggestions and, and and give the people what they want, especially from the board. Yeah. To the back. I enjoyed Impact. I realized I grade on a curve with Impact, and I realized there was some dumb shit on this show, but overall I enjoyed it. There, there was an and I really actually. I think for the first time in a long time, when the show went off the air a little bit early, and well, it didn't go off the air early, but my, my DVR, my DVR records until 11 o'clock, and apparently this show likes to go till 11:01, and so every week I miss the last minute of the show without fail, and normally I'm overjoyed that my DVR cut it off. You wish you cut off five minutes early. But in, on this show, they finish with the Mick Foley appearance on the big screen and the uh, his first day de- his debut basically on Impact, and the thing cut off and I got pissed off. Like I actually wanted to see where this was fucking going and I couldn't. That's true. So screw you, TNA. <laughs> well, <laughs> Get your goddamn show to end on time or fix my DVR. Yeah, I'm not doing it manually. One or the other. It's not my job. But the fact you wanted to see the ending is really good. It is. It's it, very unusual. It's a grave improvement here. Bizarre, so. really. Anyway, Joe came out and cut him a promo about what a bitch Sting was. He said he had a black eye because he was working all the time, and AJ Styles was always on the road and never got to see his kids. And apparently Sting, or yeah, Sting is supposed to be a heel because he signed a sweet deal with TNA. How does that make this man a heel? I, I, I don't have an answer. I, I guess if, if, I don't know, he, he signed a deal, and because he's living up to his deal, that makes him bad. I just know that he said Sting had never bled and never sacrificed with TNA, and I just started thinking about Sting taking bumps and the thumbtacks of the Abyss, and Sting, I, I think he had a match, it was the Jared or Angle, but he took a baseball bat to the face. That's <laughs> so right, yeah. He has bled Which and sacrificed a lot for this company, in fact. Well, he did, but he was not supposed to, but then he sold it when the match was over. But yeah, he, he has had bled and sacrificed. So then we had the, oh, he said he was going to uh, beat up Sting at the pay-per-view, and I don't know why he wasn't angry that Sting was getting a title shot at the pay-per-view for doing jack shit. Well, I guess he was, that actually would make sense because he's happy he gets to kick Sting's ass. All right, fine. And he said once he beat Sting and retired him, Sting could kiss his ass. Yes. Joe's delivery here was very good. The the promo itself had some logicals, but what, what, what more do you expect? So Jared arrived and said he had something for Sting to hear later on. We had Angle come out and remind us that several weeks ago, AJ had stolen his medals, and I guess he's going to take him out of his ass, which he still has not done yet. I almost completely forgot about that storyline until they reminded me. And they escorted him from ringside since AJ was out next to wrestle. It was AJ and Christian against the Motor City Machine Guns. They had a really fun match for the time they were allotted. And this was actually similar to that Jeff Hardy-Kendrick match on on, uh, SmackDown as... uh, 
Christian was there throwing Saban around like he was a power wrestler. Yeah. Which I enjoyed. Doing SOS slams and stuff. So then we had Christian wiping out Shelly with a dive. Saban went for the cradle shock. AJ hit the Styles Clash for the pin. And this was the kind of match that could make this company great if they just did it every week. And then... Uh, and if they gave him more time. All, this all went like three minutes. Yeah. So just by the time I was thinking into it, it ended. I didn't even care about three minutes. If they could just have this kind of wrestling every week, they'd be great. Instead, they have shit, which we'll get into later. So anyway, afterwards, Christian wanted a handshake. Shelly flipped him off. Machine guns turning heel. Well, they shook AJ's hand and they didn't shake Christian, so ah. eh, who cares? So they don't respect Christian. Yeah, because they, apparently all young guys hate all old men. Yeah, and Christian's so much older than the rest of them. Yes. Well, actually, he is a hell of a lot older than Shelly and Saban, but not so much AJ. But How old is AJ? He's 28, 29. He's, AJ was on the Dying Days of Thunder, wasn't he? So, yeah, he's older than Saban and Shelly. They said Booker T was uh, no stranger to pain and that he had crossed the line from obscurity to immortality. Yes, obscurity in WWE and WCW, but immortality in, in, uh, in TNA. Crossed the line. So then they had an interview, and Charmel was with him, and he said there was no respect amongst the youngsters. He was going to beat up Lethal tonight for disrespecting Randy Savage. Borash said that wasn't disrespect. It was, um, what do you say? A, a, an homage. Tribute. Tribute, yes. Tribute. And uh, Booker didn't want to hear it. Booker here, we talked about the incident with where uh, the, the machine gun shook AJ's hand but didn't shake Christian's. He described this as happening earlier tonight, whereas if you're watching the show, it happened not 60 seconds earlier. Yeah. It actually had had just happened, and that's just, you know, TNA being planned poorly and Impact being put together in a haphazard manner. Abdul Bashir did a promo, and he, of course, he began speaking in a foreign language, which caused the blonde to become scared. She began looking around in fear when he began speaking in a language other than English. And... Talked about current events, stock market, said the belt was his hostage. Said it didn't matter what anyone tried to do with him. He'd lost everything, and so there was nothing more to lose. And I keep thinking, what has the Sheik lost? <laughs> yes. well, he, he may Is he about... talking about his WWE job? Could be, that was could the be. most important thing in the world, and now he's stuck in TNA, and he wants to let everybody know that they're going to have pain because of this? He said that uh, He said people had lost all their money. In the stock market crash, and he said, you think that's bad? Try losing your life. And I thought, you're dead? <laughs> you I, don't, you I don't know. You don't look dead. And, and then he said the X Division belt was step one in putting his life back together. And I thought, Christ, that sucks. <laughs> what a life you've lost. So then we had the Prince Justice Brotherhood against Petey, Johnny Devine, and Jimmy Rave. Match was fine. The big story was afterwards. The yes, it was. Bad guys were beating up the good guys, and they threw down a ref, Shane Sewell, and he responded by Shane Sewelling up. He went nuts with no joke, the best babyface comeback of anybody this entire company. Yeah. And he ran everyone together. He tossed them aside. He kicked Lance low. He threw him over the top. He sent him packing. The place went nuts. This was fucking awesome. Shane Sewell's my favorite wrestler in TNA. Yeah, he's By awesome. leaps and bounds. I've only seen him in action twice, really. And, and th this is even better than the other one, because he, he sold losing his temper so great. He got shoved down, and he, he, he pushed himself up, and he got a far away look in his eyes. He stared at the mat, and he fired up, and he clapped his hands, and he ran in place, and he was throwing guys all over and whipping ass, and it was awesome. That's yeah. the end. That's the part where you move to move on to the next segment. I just like that that uncomfortable pause right there after you freaked out. Then we had the Tanay press conference. It was actually on the Impact set. A, a no press conference. There was no press. Representing TNA was Tanay, Don West, Cornette, and Matt Morgan. They were celebrating the fact that Morgan's DNA is being sent into space, so if the world ends, they will have the DNA of a perfect man to repopulate the Earth. I swear to God this is That's what they what were saying. Yes. And, uh, yeah, so... There you go. I guess it's actually happening, because I heard that they're doing the same thing with Stephen Colbert, who, the idea of Stephen Colbert and Matt Morgan, one of these guys is the perfect man. Hmm. Yeah, there was also a segment right before this where, uh, I believe it was Borash, but he got a hold of Sting on his way up to the Raptors, and Sting said he was interested to hear what Jerry had to say, and then he walked up the stairs. Yeah. <sighs> Indeed. Jackie went to the Spanish announcer's table and slapped Hector Guerrero. Beer Money showed up and beat the crap out of him. Friends never showed up, by the way. LAX 
never bothered to make the save. So then Tracy came out on the ramp and said, since she was, did, did they? They did. It, 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 beer, it was Beer Money and Jackie Beanie and Hector and LDX ran out and cleared the house, and then Tracy came out, or came on the screen, I, I think, and said, everyone to the office. I forgot that part. It doesn't matter. Anyway, she's knockout law. She wanted Hector and Cornette in the office right now. Then we had the Roxy rough cut talked about how she was tough. We had Cornette having the meeting with Hector, Tracy, and Jackie. Tracy's okay, idea you, was... You're, you're skipping a ton of stuff. What? You skipped an entire promo with Matt Morgan and Abyss, which is bad, but I, I bring it up only because Matt Morgan... After he uh he opened the promo and said, I watched the tape, I know you didn't hit me with a chair. Which makes Matt Morgan perhaps the first wrestler ever, and certainly the wrestler, first wrestler in TNA, I to actually watch the tape of the show and know what happened at, when it, behind his back. So thumbs up to Matt Morgan for that one. Beyond that, Matt Morgan wants to team more. Abyss wants to tear out his hair and talk to his therapist. Team 3D came in and challenged him. There's some wacky tag team gauntlet in the pay-per-view, but... I'm just thrilled that someone actually watched the show that was on and knows what was going on. That made me so happy. That's more than I do, apparently. Indeed. Uh, that was actually a really good segment. Here's the problem, everybody. Remember when I got that um, that stupid optical mouse? Mm. That I was the laser mouse? Yeah. I It just wasn't working for me. So, so I, you were distracted I, by a... Uh... No, shut up. Shut the fuck up here. So I, I went back to... Uh, I w- I went back to the the uh, the non laser mouse, and when I was going back and forth, I had to adjust the mouse settings because when I plugged the laser mouse in, the slightest movement of the mouse would cause the cursor to fly all the way across the screen. So I had to slow it down, and I had to slow down the wheel, and then of course when that failed, I had to put the deal back. So anyway, the point is, the wheel on my mouse when I used to scroll it down. It would scroll down like a line per click. Now a click is apparently about five lines. So when I got to the bottom of this report here talking about the DNA of Matt Morgan, I rolled the thing down one time, and apparently it jumped like eight lines, and I totally missed that entire thing with them having the uh, promo. So anyway, I blame technology. That's why this whole thing went awry. And uh, it was not a lack of of me paying attention. So there you go. That was an awesome story, dude. (laughs) It was, and that's why I had to turn you down so I could get the goddamn thing out. Wow. Okay. So, to re- recap this uh, last little bit we talked about, Sting went up in the rafters. It's rafters. They announced Matt Morgan's DNA is going into space. They did a promo with Matt Morgan and Abyss. Beer Money beat up Hector. Roxy talked about being stiff, and then Sting walked down the stairs. Why was Sting upstairs in the first place? He just went up there, and he walked back down. It a piss. <laughs> There's a men's room up there. I don't know. <laughs> it is a, a rhetorical where question. Is the me- where is the men's room? We don't know. I, I guess I don't know. It could be anywhere. Maybe there's one up there. He could go up there in the rafters and piss on the building every night. I would. A lucky bastard. Then we had the, hopefully not skipping anything here, Sting cutting a promo. Oh, no, the announcement that you uh, cut me off on. Tracy wanted beer Just money. To save the show. Don't mind Shut me. Shut the fuck up. Beer money and Jackie against LAX and Hector. And Jackie was actually down with all of this. And apparently the spike decree against no man-on-woman violence has been lifted. And they said the loser lost his job as manager for good. So, sucks to be LAX. Too bad for them. They lost both their managers. Then we had Sting come out and uh, cut a promo. Fans were actually chanting, you suck. I don't know why. He hadn't even said anything yet. I, I think it was a small vocal minority. Because mm-hmm. he got cheers later. Said Joe was immature, not smart enough to know what was really going on. He said he was mad. He said, why was Joe mad? Because he went to his kids' football games. He said, Joe, when Joe was a kid, he was working in tiny buildings for 25 bucks a shot. Said he'd been doing this for 20 years, which, as a person who has been wrestling for 10 years, I cannot fathom Sting only being wrestling for 20 years. Well, he's wrestled for more than that. Can't be right. 20 years ago, I believe, was the big match with Flair, and he had already been wrestling for like five years at that point. So I don't think he'd been wrestling for five years. I think maybe a year or two. I think it was more than that. Him and was... Warrior broke in together in like 86 or 87. I think it was only I'm a year almost two. positive. It was certainly more than 20. I think it was about 20. I'd say 22. Let's find out when Sting broke in. I say 22. Let's see here. Steve Borden. The always. Uh, accurate Wikipedia. A great site. Uh, Sting. Uh, debut 1985. 
23 years. 23. Okay, I was close. You were actually technically closer than me. I was off by one year. I was off by two. All right, so anyway, that's still absurd. So then we add the, um, anyway, he cut his promo and, uh. He learned respect from the best. He that's right. Learned respect from Magnum TA and Dusty Rhodes and Tully Blanchard and Ric Flair. Said he was, Joe was bigger, faster, stronger, and younger. And fatter. He just, I thought he, when he said faster, I thought he was going to say fatter. And I was going to. I was thinking awesome, but then he changed it to faster. But he was a veteran and still had some tricks up his sleeve. So this was actually a great promo. So way to go, Sting. His promos have been great since. Uh, he had the one bad one of the being at the pay per view, but other than that, his promos were awesome. I, I I did like he had he talked about Bound for Glory 06 was something, and oh Bound for Glory 07 was amazing, but Bound for Glory 08 is going to be unbelievable. And I thought, what the hell happened to Bound for Glory's 06 and 07? I don't have any idea. He was in them. I see. And uh, one of them was against AJ because he said phenomenal. And I guess actually would have, the first one was Jarrett and the second one was AJ, I'll bet. Anyway. So then we had the interview with Christian and AJ about the match earlier. And, and Borash wanted to know why AJ didn't stand up for Christian. And a- AJ told him to stop trying to stir shit. The two of them were on the same page. And Christian said, well, what page? He said he was the champ, which he is in fact not. And AJ needed to remember who put him in the spotlight. So, yes, two more partners fighting. It's actually much worse than that because it's these two men fighting again. I believe in the year 2008, I could be mistaken, this could be going back to last year. But I believe in 2008, these men have gone from partners to feuding to partners to feuding again in nine months. And they're apparently going to be feuding again. Yes, I am tired of it. So then we had, oops, wrong page right here. Then we had Lethal doing a promo. Of course, yelled at the blonde. I'm just waiting for one fucking promo where somebody doesn't yell at the blonde. That's all I ask. One promo. I don't even care who it is. Somebody please do a promo and don't yell at the blonde. So anyway, he said that he basically cut a promo on Booker saying Savage was his idol and he was going to kick Booker's ass for accusing him of disrespecting him. Another great promo. This was a great promo. It annoyed me at first because he's supposed to be Randy Savage, yet here he is cutting a... He got a Jay Lethal promo, which indicates that his Black Machismo promos are all fake, which annoys me. That being said, this is a really great promo, and he he was full of piss and vinegar, and he was going to whip Booker's ass. Yeah, so then we had the... Um, actually, there were a lot of things on the show, but this was just another one, this match. It was a it was a good match. It was, it was uh, Booker versus Lethal. Good match, shitty finish, which, um, well, Booker's... Booker didn't sell too well for the comeback. A lot of wackiness that he wasn't ready for. But anyway, Charmel tripped Lethal right in front of the referee. I mean, she's staring right at her. And her trip led to the finish. Not a DQ. This is why I hate this program. See, I, This is why I hate this program every single fucking week. I understand your viewpoint. I saw, I saw the exact same thing, but I took it as a positive because at least, although the interference was right in front of the ref and not a DQ... At least it led right to the finish. Well, that's true. Usually there's interference, and then they just keep wrestling. This is interference for a point, so baby steps. I will take this as a positive. I I hate this company. I don't even know who to blame. I mean, I, I just it, blame it, the entity the entity that is TNA. If I were an indie promoter, and my referee was so fucking bad at his job that he was always in position to see people interfere, he would be fired. I'd fire him. He would never be refereeing again. You are the fucking referee. You know what the fucking finish is. This is not a secret. So get in position so you can't fucking see. Is this that hard? Apparently it is. I used to laugh when I would hear people go, man, I'm training referees. And I'd always think, who the fuck needs to go to school to learn how to be a referee? I worked, I worked with some guys who needed to go to school. I, I refereed. That was one of the first things I did, and I, I, I figured it out fast. But the idea of a refereeing school was was baffling to me. And I watched this show, and these guys clearly have never been a refereeing school. Refereeing, hey, don't get me wrong, refereeing is not easy. But if you got a clue, it ain't hard. These dumb fucks don't have a clue. Seriously. Okay, what's the finish? Well, the finish is Charmel's going to grab Lethal's foot, and then I'm going to hit the axe for the pin. Oh, okay. So now you're going to stand in position to be looking right at her when she trips him. Was this the Why same? are you employed? Was this the same ref who did the Kip James match? 
Probably. I think it no, was. No, I don't think it was, actually. Okay. I think it was a different one. But uh, that, yeah. that guy is an idiot, too. We'll get to that I'll, one. I'll get to that's him That's a significantly second. larger idiot, but... No, a, he's not. This you, guy's a so. bigger idiot. Mm. The, the guy in the in the Taylor Wilde match was just in a in a bad position and something goofy happened. This was this was there's a difference because they were doing a spot that involved reversal and he happened to be in the way. Fine, okay. When you've got a finish, you know what the finish is, you know when it's coming, and you know you're not supposed to see it. To be standing right there to look at it, fuck you. God, and, that pisses me off. And you ruined not just the spot in the middle of the match, you ruined the big finish. Yeah. The end. What you an sc- idiot. Screwed up the end. Just yeah. an idiot. I, I must also make note, there was a point here where they were they were just wrestling back and forth, and Jay Lethal reversed an Irish whip, which caused Don West, who has been announcing pro wrestling now professionally for six years, to scream, Did you see that counter? Yeah. <laughs> Everything's new to this man. So the blonde interviewed the beautiful people, and Billy Gunn had the line of the century when he said, Rhino had stuck his horn in their business for the last time. You know, you've often said that the best trio possible would be the beautiful people with Maurice. I may have been wrong. Kip James is not a bad substitute. Kip James is <laughs> massively growing up. I didn't realize how much he was missing until he went in there, and, and he, he completes the circle somehow. But yes, when he, he, Rhino has been sticking his horn in their business, and Angelina was distressed, and she announced she could not go out for the match. She had to stay backstage because she had a blemish. And the best line of all was when Velvet, again, yelled at the blonde chick, of course, but at least this was funny because she called her, and I quote, an idiot hole. <laughs> yes. What is an idiot hole? I don't know. Apparently Lauren's one of them, though. Great TV. This is this thing was so awesome. So then we had Taylor Wilde and Rhino against Velvet Sky and Kip James, which should be a pay-per-view match, by the way. And the referee idiocy in this one was, it was, uh, what the hell's his name? Referee, uh, he did the gimmick. Slick Johnson? Slick Johnson. I'm thinking back to WCW. Slick Johnson was the ref, and they did a switch, and fucking Slick Johnson is standing right there in the corner that they're running into. And the spot was just supposed to be, Billy gets thrown into the corner and comes out for a hip toss. Very easy, very Very simple. easy. He goes into the corner, the ref's right there, and he bonks into him. Billy Gunn stops what he's doing. He looks over at Slick Johnson with complete disdain, as if to say, get the fuck out of the way, you dumbass. And then he proceeds to run and take a hip toss. Yes. The match, the match literally, like a video game, went on pause, <laughs> so he could, he could, uh, visually fuck this man off. And then it went on unpause, and the spot just continued. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, that was great. And Velvet then, Sky was also involved. She has improved dramatically. Yes, she has. She, the, the highlight was she took a, I believe it was a, 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 a hip toss and then an arm drag or something like that. And this caused her to throw her hands in the air and wail and scramble for the tag. Yes. And then, of course, he finished another awesome TNA moment. Angelina ran in and gave a pipe to Velvet Sky. A <laughs> pipe. Not a small pipe like you would smoke with. I a, thought... a giant pipe that you would use to build a fucking chain link fence. Yes. And she swung it. She swung it at uh, the the woman's champion, whatever the fuck her name is. Taylor. Taylor Wilde. Right in front of the ref. Yes. Right, right in front of the ref. Didn't care. No. Didn't care. No. And I guess the explanation was, well, it didn't connect. I don't look at me. So you're telling me that if I if I walk into a bank and I pull a gun. But I don't pull the trigger. It's okay. If you here's a better analogy. If you go to the bank and you pull a gun and you say, "Give me money," and they say no, and you fire the gun but you miss, and then you say "fuck" and you leave, no one calls the cops. Guess not. No, not in not in Orlando apparently. So stupid finish to a fun match as hey, usual. I, I do have one complaint. Kip James came out with Velvet Sky and they went to climb the ropes and I thought. Kip James has to do the beautiful people entrance, and he didn't. No. He just climbed to the climbed to the ring. I was very disappointed. I need to see Kip James hump the ropes. And then we had. It's crucial. <sighs> All right. Oh wait, there's a, they went to commercial, and when they came back, I want to hear more about how crucial this is, Vince. Well, it's, it's it can, what is it going to do for your life to see to see Kip James humping the ropes? It will make me laugh because it's funny. Kip James is a six foot five giant of a man. <laughs> to see him acting the same way these 120 pound women do is comedy. Anyway, they, they went to commercial when they came hey. back. 
Perhaps. <laughs> At this moment, perhaps. All right. Well, fine. I, I, I'm not denying that this is a, a, a gay urge. I'm... Regardless, Awesome Kong came out. She beat up Taylor Wilde for a bit. The heels ran wild. It ended with both Taylor Wilde and Rhino getting the brown paper bag treatment, which has always been great, except they now have a brown paper bag that has Kip James' face on it. Yeah. And you will recall on the board about six, eight months ago, there was a trend where people would make any random subject, and then you would click on a picture, and there would be a photo of Billy Gunn shrugging. I think it's the same face that is on this paper bag. Of course it is. And it's awesome. And we had the big main event angle with Jared coming out, and people chanted, welcome back. And he talked about how he was the owner. Yes, he's the owner of TNA. And the founder. Founder. And talked about WCW going out of business and how he created this place for youngsters to get a shot in this uh, business and how guys like AJ and Joe had carried the company and showed him respect like he'd showed them and called out Sting and said he was full of shit. Said this wasn't about respect. This was about these guys nipping at your heels Said this wasn't WCW, it was TNA, which was a hilarious line. And anyway, Angle came out and said he was going to shoot. Always awesome. 2008. 2008, yeah. everybody. Uh-huh. And Angle's like, I'm going to shoot. Brother. So anyway, he started to shoot. And he said two years ago, uh, Jared had to leave due to family issues. And he handpicked one guy. This was Jared speaking. And that guy was Kurt, he said. It was the worst decision he ever made. And said Kurt had lost it all, his wife, his title, his medals. Only thing left to lose is dignity. And Angle said, two years ago, Jarrett left because he was over the hill. Sting had kicked his ass, and he had no heart. And he said he, Kurt, had carried the company for two years, and not once did Jarrett thank him for saving his goddamn company. He said Jarrett and the fans were all assholes. This was an awesome promo by Kurt Angle, by the way. And... Anyway, he said, why trade words? Let's trade punches at Bound for Glory. And Jared said he had nothing left to prove, and he was going to leave. And as he was going to leave, Angle told him to come back so that he could tell him that if he wasn't going to wrestle, he needed to leave. So Jared said, listen, um, you don't want any of this pain that I've been carrying for two years. But, he said, and he pointed to the big screen, and it was Mick Foley who um, said hello to Kurt. And I believe, if I read the taping spoilers correctly, Kurt, uh, Jarrett, I guess, sign, or, I guess they suggested it was going to be Foley versus Angle, which is actually not going to be. But, um, you know, they're going to announce on TV that it's not going to be that match. However, tickets have already gone on sale, so basically they're false advertising here. Good. But, um, that should surprise nobody. But anyway, they, uh, they're going to end up doing Angle and Jarrett at the pay-per-view, and this was a great segment. I thought everybody was great here. I thought Jarrett was great. I thought Sting was great. I thought Kurt was awesome, and uh, Foley being there was just fucking surreal. So two thumbs up to the uh, end of Impact this week. This segment in and of itself was phenomenal. Uh, Everyone was great, and I mostly just floored they actually gave any segment. Literally, I'm I'm something to give any segment this much time to sink in. Nothing was rushed. Nothing was hurried. No, no, nothing was... Well, was... Jarrett was in it. Fine. <laughs> but no, but that's the point. Well, then Jarrett needs to be in more angles. Well, he's going to be. Good. Now, I'll remember you said this, by the way. I, I may change my mind in three months, but I'm, I'm any, anything on, on Impact that has actually given a decent amount of time to, to, to sink in and, and, and to have any kind of, frankly, impact on me, that's good. Most stuff just goes in and out so fast, I don't remember it two minutes later. And this was given a lot of time, and that made me happy. I do wish... They had done a better job over the past year, several years, really, of building to this promo. Because they t- kept talking about, guys were arguing about who had carried the company. And I just kept thinking, carried it to what? <laughs> carried it to putting on a shitty show every week and another shitty show every month. It's worldwide. Millions of viewers. Yeah. Jerry was talking about this. He so. did at one point. He was thanking everyone who had helped him get to this point, And he thanked God. And he thanked his wife, Jill. And he thanked... Investors. A great financial partner, (laughs) which could have bumped them to the front of the line. But, yes, he thanked the person who funded the company for however many years it was before they started to break even. So there you go. I give this impact a thumbs up. This was between Shane Sewell and the beautiful people and this segment, an easy thumbs up. To the back. Impact. Impact. I got to say, I'm going to praise impact here before we before we rip it apart. Impact, they have done an awesome job building up Bound for Glory. I don't think this is going to be the biggest paper of the year, 
Because I think that that uh, Joe and Angle is going to hold that record this year. But I think this will be up significantly from their usual TNA fair. I think they've done a good job. I can name I can name the two top matches right off the top of my head, which I didn't even know what the main event of the last show was on the Go Home Show. That should tell you something right there. <laughs> That's true. I know we've got Jeff Jarrett and uh, Kurt Angle. I know we've got Sting and Samoa Joe. And I think that's all, well, there's probably some more stuff. But those are the two important ones. But Off the top of my head, I actually can name one of the match. What's that? The tag team Monsters Ball. Oh, that's right, Monsters Ball. So anyway, that's, uh, I mean, they're doing a great job. So thumbs up to them. It's not like it's going to really make any difference in the grand scheme of the pay-per-view world. But at least they're they're doing a, a pretty fine job with, with that. So there you go. Opened up with Jarrett cutting a promo, saying as the founder of TNA was proud to introduce that they had signed the greatest acquisition of all time. Acquisition, not the accusation. It was uh, Foley. Could be here next week. Yes, he, a, he said this. He literally said this was the greatest acquisition in the history of TNA. Yeah. A commentator who used to wrestle. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So then Angle came out and said, since Jarrett's head had been up his ass for 24 months, he had entered TNA, made the company what it was. He was the best. Uh, acquisition, said he turned this outhouse into a penthouse, said that Foley and Jarrett were yesterday's news, and Jarrett did say he broke in at 16, so he's got a point there. And and Foley's been retired for a long time. Since 2002? 2000. 2000, yes. I believe. Jeff said he was going to let bygones be guy. Bygones wanted to publicly apologize for saying some of the things he said to Angle, said that uh, things haven't been going the way they were supposed to be going. Said he told AJ to bring Angle his medals back. That was a good one. <laughs> that, the, that, that would be the payoff of that Angle. This is JJ scolds AJ and says, "Here, Kurt, here's your medal." Yeah. So said Angle may be a jerk, but in 1996 he served the country proud, won a medal. Said he was a true American hero. Angle said, "Wow, that's awfully swell." Now get the fuck out of my ring. Said he wanted to uh, call him a scared little bitch. Told him to, uh... It, it was great because he said, get the hell out of my ring. So Jarrett did. And then Kurt said, no, wait, stay. He did that last week, too. Oh, God. It was awesome both times. So, anyway, he said, uh, you know what, Jeff? You're just like your old man, a washed-up failure. And I guess Jeff thought, well, yeah, because he kept walking. And then Angle told him to go home and tell his uh, wife and children that he was a quitter. Uh, his oh, children. just his children. <laughs> Sorry. That he was a quitter. I actually, um, I thought of the Shawn Michaels thing, in fact, here. Because it was almost the exact same promo. But it worked here as well. So, anyway, uh, then Jared got back in the ring and said Angle had no idea the trials and tribulations he'd been through and he was never going to quit. And said if Kurt wanted to coax him back into the ring for a match, well, fine. So they're on for Bound for Glory. And I thought this was a hell of a segment, actually. It had its moments. I, I it, it's, still, it's like what you said about Hunter last week, how what he does when he's selling is good, but he's spent so many years being invulnerable that no one buys it, so it doesn't work. It's kind of the same thing here, because Kurt Angle talks about taking TNA from the outhouse to the penthouse, and I think, no, you're full of shit. I don't believe you. Well, And J- and Jared talks about how, you know, he can't believe how great the company is now, and he calls Mick Foley the greatest acquisition, acquisition in TNA history, and I think, no, I don't believe you either. I, I, I did think it was hilarious when... when well, Angle- let me cut you off there for a second. All right. The problem is, this is pro wrestling, and you have to do that. Like, there was a segment also on this show where, where uh, Sting came out... Who was it? Was it the Sting promo? Um, somebody. I see what you're trying to say, though. He can't come on and say, uh, you can't have Kurt Angle come on and say, I came here and since I've been here, ratings haven't gone up at all. And we're doing the same buy rates we did two years ago. Yeah, you can't so say that. Sting, I get that. Sting said something wacky. And it was just, I mean, you know, you, you have to hype everything. And, you know, it is the, Tony Schiavone did during the peak. Every match and was the greatest. That company. <laughs> well, for a while it was at the peak. The point is, you have to have some hyperbole in there. That's why it's called hype. Uh, so I, I didn't have a problem with that. I, I, I would draw a line somewhere between hype and out and out bullshit. If he, if Kurt had just come out and said, "I have been the biggest star in this company for the past two years," I've been fine with that. Or I've been the best wrestler in this company for the past two years, I would have been fine with that. But he talked about how he had raised the company, and I thought you're full of shit, and I don't care about what you say. But there was a great moment here, and not necessarily great in a good way. Right after Angle uh, mentioned Jarrett's daughters by name and called him out and said, you can go tell them you're a quitter, Mike Fnay said, and I quote, Kurt Angle just crossed the line. <laughs> I'm sick of that, by the way. Now, since WrestleMania, and I remember this because I have a photo of myself flicking off the giant sign, Tinia's crossfa- uh, catchphrase has been, cross the line. So apparently whenever they air a promo, what they mean is, tell your children you're a quitter. 
<laughs> That's the literal definition of crossing the line. Apparently it is. Apparently it is. They plug the knockouts DVD by saying we could hear Gail Kim's final interview before she left TNA. <laughs> Seriously, that's what they said. What an amazing company this is. She She's done with this place, but she's you can hear her final interview. So buy our DVD. Rock and Raves against Matt Morgan and Abyss. Matt Morgan was horrible during this match. He had the most indie, school, clothesline, riffic comeback you've ever seen. And pin Rave... They said Rave was the newest member of Morgan's Mile High Club. The list of many fucked at 30,000 feet. And then they, uh, Team 3D came out, announced Monster's Ball and No Surrender. Abyss went crazy because he's just not that guy anymore, which, of course, begs the question, why does he have to do the match? Since when are Team 3D bookers? I don't understand any of this. You're, you're right about all of that, but at least they came out. <laughs> Team 3D, uh, they cut a good promo. It was mostly brother... Devon was awesome. Mostly Devon talking as Bubba stood beside him and just danced to music in his head. <laughs> I don't know what was up with him tonight, but he was dancing. He came out straight into their music, and then the music stopped, and he just kept moving. Yeah. But uh, they, 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 they talked about... He listed all the cha- titles they had won all over the world. They're undefeated in Japan. The fact that Abyss and Matt Morgan got lucky at the pay-per-view means nothing. They're going to get a rematch. So he called out the match between... Us, you, and any other tag team, any other tag team that wants to get involved in the match will be Monsters Ball. And right then, Abyss started to freak out, and and immediately I I knew, holy shit, they have I I don't know how they have the power to book a match, but apparently they do. And in doing so, they have uh, successfully screwed over Abyss here because he either can't wrestle or can't or he either he can't compete in the match at all, or he he will have to uh, violate his principles. So. His principle. Sure. Well, he's, he just, he no longer uses weapons. He, he's, sure. He is a, a, a pacifist in this violent world, if you want to use that word. Yeah. He, he believes in unarmed combat. Mono okay. a mano. And uh, now they've forced him into a weapons match, so he is screwed. So, at least after all these months of all the wacky promos of Abyss in his pajamas in the hospital and all the, all the times he ran down at random to save people only when he didn't save other people and all the times he threw the stupid chair down, it all paid off here and it all made sense in the end. So that's good. Roxy has a passion for hardcore, so off my date list. Lauren interviewed Beer Money about the match with LAX. The losing team loses their manager, and this was a a pretty good promo. I mean, basically they they were very sad that Jackie might have to leave forever if they lost, and and uh, <laughs> Storm actually had an inadvertently funny line when he said, "We could have any any of the girls around here, the beautiful people, but we don't want a pretty face." We just want this tough gal. And Jackie looked at him, and I just thought it was going to be part of the joke, and then she just looked back at the camera. Yeah. So then uh, she eventually ran off all nervous or whatever, and, and Rude said, seriously, if we lose tonight, she's done. And then Storm picked up his liquor helmet and said, we're not losing, not on my watch. He's so great. And I thought, are you fucking guys baby faces or heels? Because <laughs> this was the best baby face promo I've seen all day. Well... That's true, but at, at least... It's fucking awesome. It was awesome. There's no denying that. And then I saw LAX later, and I was like, I hope that fucking extra Guerrero loses. I don't need to see that dude on my TV anymore. Yeah. God bless him, but Hector Guerrero just... God bless the guy, but anybody that tunes into that show for the first time, or... or, or I mean, he would be just like a parody of Eddie Guerrero. Yeah. Like, the people would have no idea what's going on. Right. They'd be like, why is this guy playing Eddie Guerrero? He's an Eddie Guerrero ripoff. And he's no good at it. And he's a bad Eddie Guerrero, Eddie Guerrero ripoff. I'm sure he's a great commentator. Nice guy. So anyway, then we had the uh, Kong against Mercedes Steel, which was a squash. And uh, anyway, uh, Raisha came down to the ring. And Did you ever notice an impact? We always say the match... It was bad, it was good, it was a squash. Anyway, what really happened was... Yeah. Because the post-match angles are always more important. Yeah. And I'm sure I see that every week, but it, was, it just struck me here. So anyway, Raisha came out, but it was clear that she was not Raisha. And, of course, afterwards, Kong tried to kill this girl again. But uh, Raisha made the save with a chair shot, took the mask off. It was Roxy. Beat up Kong. They had to send out geeks to break it up to save Kong, mind you. And then Raisha limped out on the ramp with her hands bound with rope. <laughs> and the announcer was saying, ah, that's why she wasn't out here before, because she'd been tied up backstage. Which begs the question, she is still tied up now. How did she get out here? I just love the idea that 
You watch SmackDown and, and Brie Bella, whose name I know, by the way. Brie Bella goes up to Marie and says, hey, can, I, can you make me an outfit? And just in case there's a snag, can you make an identical second copy? And, you know, it makes sense. Meanwhile, I guess we have to believe that Roxy formulated a plan to beat up Awesome Kong. And the plan involved her going to Marshall's or Michelle's or whatever the fucking fabric store is. Buying a yard of black fabric and a bunch of fucking jewels and making a, a Raisha Saeed outfit head to toe. A costume. A costume. Identical to Raisha's. And then finding a way to accost and beat up and hold hostage Raisha. And, and bind her. And then sneak out so that after the match was over, when Kong did something that one would presume was, um, not premeditated, now she makes a save with her chair and then just punches her a lot. What a plan! And yes, that, 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 that ridiculous. The key thing here: the announcers are going crazy about what a great plan this was. What a brilliant plan by Roxy! And all I can think was, what exactly did she accomplish? <laughs> she punched her a few times. <laughs> she punched Awesome Kong some. Wow, amazing! You're a genius. Then we had Karen's angle, which was actually. I should, let me say this. Karen's angle was awesome whenever Christian was just cutting a solo promo. As soon as she got involved and started screaming at him, the whole thing just fell apart. Even when he was cutting a solo promo, though. No, 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 no. no. First off, her question was, whose side are you on? Yeah. And he made it very clear, I haven't decided. And she demanded an answer. She would not take no for an answer. They always do that in the it show. It was I, unacceptable I, that he could not make up his mind yet. They always do that in the show. I never understand why. I I I hate Karen's angle. <laughs> Somebody Wait. that just tunes in for the first time would see this and wonder why is this woman employed? She has absolutely zero charisma. Mm-hmm. And when she when she debuted on the show, she was a fucking fountain, a Niagara Falls of charisma. No more. She ran dry. Oh, my God, did she run dry. I will say her breasts look great this evening. Sure. That is an important part of, of, of this particular segment. But uh, even when Christian was rambling on cutting his own solo promo, he was saying good things about what how he was not that far removed from breaking himself, and at the same time, he was kind of on the verge of being an older veteran. And after every single sentence, Karen would nod and go, right. Yeah. Right. And they had to keep cutting right. back to her repeatedly. Right. Over and over and over and over again. Right. I hated this. Right. So. Yeah, so. <laughs> enough out of you. I'm just making a point. Then we add the Borash interviewing. Oh, I, I, I did love the end of this segment, which was Cage's cell phone went off. It was his agent, Nick, and he took the call and walked away. Yeah. <laughs> that was the end of the segment. Booker T did an interview. They've totally forgotten that Joe gave Booker his locker room because now it's like Booker's locker room. And I, I wish we could have a segment where we watch where Joe changes. I don't necessarily need to see him take his trousers off or anything like that, but just where is he changing at? He gave up his locker room to this guy months ago, and apparently he doesn't have the balls to ask for it back. So anyway, they did a promo, and and uh, that was that. Yeah, he did say here that he is literally from Africa now. Yeah. He's no longer from Houston. Where I come from in Africa, LAX and Hector versus Beer Money and Jackie. Here's how screwed up TNA is, everybody. LAX and Hector versus T- uh, uh, Beer Money and Jackie, as you said, they had to specifically say, have the announcer say, this is a non-title six-person match. Yeah. Because this company is so screwed up, if they didn't say non-title, they think their fans would assume the tag titles were on the line in the six-person intergender affair. That's bad. Not to mention, you've got three males against two males and a female, and the two males and the female are supposed to be heels. Also true. So, anyway... They had a match. It was good early. In fact, I really liked the match until all of a sudden it became shit. We just had a million people doing a million things. We had a ton of near falls. We had people running around all over the place. And Rude finally pinned Hernandez with a beer helmet. I have no idea how this came about. And uh, I, I don't have the energy in me to rant right now, but I, I saw the Kurt Angle quote in the sun or whatever where he said, there's always interference in matches because they want to they want to protect the loser. And all I got to say is that's why no one's over. Yeah. That's why this company is a complete failure Indeed. in many ways. Yes. 
So anyway, there was, I don't know, my, my favorite part of this was actually very early on when Jackie distracted Hector and he gave chase and they sprinted up the ramp and disappeared. And the guys kept wrestling. They went to commercial. They came back. They were still wrestling. And then Jackie came sprinting down the ramp with Hector in hot pursuit again. Apparently they had been running as fast as they could for like 10 minutes and were not even sweating. Amazing athletes, these two. Got the love in with Sanjay and Val. And of course, it's bad enough when you got like Frank Mir at six feet tall or six six or whatever he is interviewing a 145 or 135 pound guy. Here they had Sanjay and Val being interviewed by the blonde who looked so unbelievable. And then she's sitting there right next to SoCal Val. Mm. And I thought, wow, it sucks to be you, Val. So anyway, the story is that Guru told her that his father was the richest guy in India. And when he kicks the bucket, they get all the money. So yeehaw, yip de doo There was one other uh, stupid bit of stupidity in the LAX match. They mentioned that Sting was going to be involved in some fan autograph show or fan Q&A or some sort of fan meeting. And then Mike Tanay said, so you get an autograph and a lecture. Yeah. They buried their own promotional appearance. Yeah. This company sucks. So then Sting came out and cut a promo about how Jared was swerving everyone. Said it was Jeff that called him and asked him out of retirement to wrestle for TNA. Said uh, Jared told him that if he came back, Spike would pick him up. Said right around that time, he got a call from Vince McMahon. And he decided he wanted to uh, go with TNA instead. He said Vince offered him millions and he turned it down. So Jarrett shouldn't accuse him of being all about the money because if he was, he'd be in WWE. This is an example of when you lie. <laughs> Indeed. You bitched earlier about hyperbole. And meanwhile, Sting comes out here and tells the truth. That's worse. I Right here, you're exactly right. That is significantly worse. What he said was literally... I turned down the big bucks. I turned down the major leagues to come down here in this rinky dink shithole in Orlando. Yeah. So, said if Jared didn't like him, fine. He had bigger things to worry about, like Joe and Bound for Glory. And he directed us to a screen where various people showed up. And I guess he was going to, um, he basically said, these people put me on the map many years ago, and, and this is how. And he showed all of them. It was Arn and Tully. And Dusty, Hogan, Flair. Flair got the biggest reaction of anybody, by the way. And Joe. They hated Hogan. And anyway, he uh, he put over Flair by saying that he had put Sting on the map many years ago. And again, this is a time where you don't tell the truth. What does that mean? He put me on the map in a 45-minute match. We had a great fake battle. <laughs> That's what he said. In fact, it's even worse than that when he said, Ric Flair carried me to a great fake match. Yeah. So then Sting buried Joe, said... Yeah, he didn't know how to be a champion. Need to learn some respect at the pay per view, and and uh, that was that. I thought Sting was awesome here. Mm-hmm. There was some bullshit stuff in the promo that was wacky, but Sting I thought was just great. His delivery was fantastic. His passion was awesome, and overall, despite the stupid stuff in the promo, I think it worked. It established himself basically as saying, "Look, I am a legend like these guys. I'm not an indie fat indie geek like Joe. Thus, I'm going to win." So. In the end, it accomplished his mission, and it actually got me excited for the pay-per-view on, on, on whenever it is, on Bad for Glory. It got me excited for Sting and Joe, so that's good. So it overcame its own rampant stupidity. Abyss was freaking out backstage, and we had the best segment in a while where, by the way, no beautiful people on this show. No bias. And, and I, the fact that I missed them tells you something. Makes me very sad. So Morgan told uh, Abyss that, come on, you need to face your fears. I talked to your therapist. And Morgan said, I used to be afraid of flying, and I got over that by becoming a pilot. And Abyss was called shenanigans and said, show me your wings. And um, Morgan was like, well, uh, um, I also was afraid of bears, and I got over that fear by going into the woods and beating up a thousand-pound bear with my bare hands. But you didn't know that one. All I can say is that video should be involved in a promo somehow. I don't mean Matt Morgan talking about it. I mean Matt Morgan beating up a bear. Dave McKigney could be involved. Now, who, wait, okay, <laughs> who is that person? I'm going to make you go home and look up the bear man. You mean the grizzly man? The bear man. Because he got eaten. Not that bear man, you jackass. He had a wrestling bear. He was a wrestling promoter. I see. Oh, Christ. So that's not the guy on Dancing with the Stars then? No. I see. You're He's make- also dead. You're making a joke. Okay. <laughs> no, I... I wasn't making a joke during the Dancing with the Stars segment, Vince. I was very serious about which... <laughs> I was unaware. Oh, Jesus. Borash interviewed Joe, 
who uh, said he was going to kill Sting at the pay-per-view, and then Consequences and Lethal came up and thanked him for all he'd done and said. And Creed told him to fight the power. I went out, Here's a drinking game, everybody. Every time Samoa Joe says, you see, in one of his promos, take a drink. You'll be drunk by the end of the show. Then we had uh, Samoa Joe against Sheik Abdul Bashir. This was when the show fell off a cliff. I realize it's champion versus champion. Nobody gives two fucks about the TNA X Division champion, and nobody takes him seriously at all. Sheik Bashir going toe-to-toe with Samoa Joe was the goddamn dumbest thing I've ever seen two weeks before Bound for Glory. And it gets worse as... um, as Joe won with the muscle buster, and this he was going to show Sting about what lack of respect was all about, and he put him in the choke and was killing him, and they ended up reversing the decision. So Sheik Abdul Bashir beat Joe. This was the just the dumbest. I will start with the positives. They took the crashing planes out of the Sheik's music. That's good. Here endeth the positives. Yes, uh... They made Joe look just a little bit better than Sheik Abdul Bashir, who is the comedy guy that no one cares about. Or and, and I don't even know if comedy is the right word. He's just a guy who happens to have a belt around his waist that no, no one cares about. And and yes, he he worked over Joe. <laughs> he got the heat on Joe. Worked over Joe's leg, and it was all Joe could do to pull out a victory here. And then Joe said, "This is Sheik, why these guys are geeks." Yeah. This is why people don't take a guy like Joe seriously. If Joe came out here and laid uh, the Sheik out in 40 seconds and pinned him with a muscle buster and everyone went crazy, hey, that might have worked. I, I Now listen, I realize that if Joe would have come out and just massacred Sheik Abdul Bashir, I would have probably bitched about the fact that they killed their ex-champion. True. Why did he have to be in this match? There was no, That's the question. There was no one else for Joe to beat on this evening. Sheik Abdul Bashir should not have been in this match. And you know what? Of the two scenarios, of the two scenarios, if he had to be in this match, then Joe should have just slaughtered him. Mm-hmm. This is so retarded. You're headlining what is what is essentially WrestleMania. <laughs> I understand that's the idea, but come on now. Let me think of like if if Steve Austin, if Steve Austin were headlining WrestleMania. And like Bob Holly was the U.S. champion, and Bob fucking Holly and Steve Austin went toe to toe two weeks before WrestleMania. Think about that. It would never in a million years have happened because they're not that stupid. I the same you. thing Angle said, trying to make everybody in the same level. I, I Why would you, you want to bring Joe down a level when you try to make everybody the same level? You're not making everybody a star. You're making everybody a geek. Joe gets lower to his level. Mm-hmm. You're not bringing Bashir to Joe's level. You go the other way. Dumbasses. I guarantee you that this Monday night, if Chris Jericho wrestles Santino Morella, Jericho wins quickly. Kills him. Mm-hmm. And, and Santino may be a more effective champion than the Sheik, actually, at this point. So then Joe wins, and he says, hey, Sting, here's a message for you. Here's where I think of your respect. And he takes his help, helpless opponent. Santino's not even a good example. Because Triple H went... Can uh, I finish a sentence? Hold on. Triple H went toe-to-toe with Shelton. Do yourself. No, dude, hold on a second. We're still... uh, We're talking about something we were just talking about. Can I finish that thought before you move on? Does that make sense? Carry on. Okay, you made the comparison to Santino. Santino... uh, Shelton Benjamin went toe-to-toe with Triple H. That's fine. They're roughly the same size. There's the U.S. champion and the world champion. This would be like the cruiserweight champion. Gregory Helms. Bad example. But actually, it's a fine example. Gregory Helms or who else was a cruiserweight champion? Name a random cruiserweight champion. Shannon Not Hornswoggle. Moore. Shannon Moore. If Shannon Moore went head-to-head with Triple H two weeks before WrestleMania and was, was, it was uh, um, you know, went toe-to-toe with him, it would be retarded. Now, go on. So then Joe takes his helpless opponent. You recall this whole stupid angle started when Joe had Booker, Booker T helpless and tried to kill him. And then Joe took his helpless opponent here and tried to kill him again. And all I can think was, wow, you're a dick. I hope Sting kills you. Perhaps that's good, but I could have sworn the whole idea here was for Samoa Joe to be the babyface. And why wasn't the decision reversed the first time he killed his opponent after the match? Why was the decision reversed here? How many matches on this show did we see a guy running in and the decision wasn't reversed? 
AJ did a promo saying he's proud of Gainesville, Georgia. I call bullshit. Booker T versus AJ Styles in the main event. Christian came out to watch. I did not get good reviews of this match, but I actually thought it was a good match until, of course, the last minute of the show. When I'm just going to write down, I, I had to slowly type down without any sort of, of, uh, of descriptive explanation of it, just what happened. They were struggling massively to get into position for something, which ended up being a ref bump. And after struggling to get into position, the ref was out of position still. And so AJ didn't come close to the ref. And so AJ had to land and then flail his arms backwards in the air and bonked into the referee who proceeded to take a bump. Then Charmel came in with a briefcase. Then Christian tried to save. AJ saw Christian with the briefcase. Booker shoved AJ. AJ bumped into Christian. Christian got sent outside. Booker got the briefcase. Booker hit AJ. I actually wrote Christian here, but it's AJ. And then Booker pinned AJ to win the match. Compare this, for example, to the Fit Finley match on ECW. I hated this. This made me so angry. And it gets better. Afterwards, they explain that... Who? Christian? One of these guys I know what you're talking was going to have to explain to the other guy that he was trying to help. Yes. Now, if in the world of TNA... There was no such thing as a replay. Fine. But last week, last week, Matt Morgan said, you know what? I watched the video. I was wrong. Now the announcers are, are boggled. They're baffled by how how is Christian going to prove to AJ that he was trying to help? Hmm. A mystery. If only there was some way, some sort of visual evidence we had. If only there was a solution to this problem. You know, I can't even... I, un- I understand that last week they, they set the precedent of video review among the wrestlers watching their own program and how groundbreaking that is. But you can't even see that because this all happened with several hundred witnesses. <laughs> some of whom are theoretically Christian and AJ's friends. But no one's going to tell AJ, hey, dude, Christian saved you. And then beyond that, see, I, I understand how angry you got here. I didn't get angry because I, this is just what TNA is. It's what they do. So I expect it going in. But I get angry because the rest of the show was good. See, that I, You were fooled. I, I understood the pri- prior hour and 50 minutes were merely a mirage, an illusion. This is what TNA truly is. It's bullshit. But it, I, what annoyed me most here, and again, it's something they do all the time, so I don't know why it annoyed me in this case, but... They did some stuff before commercial. They they wrestled back and forth, and they went to commercial. When they came back, they showed us, A, here is AJ's trademark dropkick spot, and B, here is Booker T getting the heat. Yeah. The two, <laughs> I guess not the most important parts of the match, but uh, the, the second and third most important parts after the finish both happened during the commercial break. This program sucks. <laughs> I still give this show... I give the show one thumb up. <laughs> but not two. I cannot give the show two thumbs up because I got so damn angry in the last 15 minutes of the show. And, uh, but I mean, on the scale of, of normal TNA shows, this was another thumbs up. That's two weeks in a row, everybody. Leading to Bound for Glory. So, <laughs> I don't know what that means. I guess means. you have to consider this an above average TNA show. <laughs> this was an above average TNA show, if you consider the average TNA show the average. In fact, this was significantly above average.